behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from playing sports to exotic whips. Ain't gotta tell me, dog. I know I'm the shit behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from music exec to this podcast. Now I finally feel at home and laugh behind the bar. What up, you monkey mouth motherfuckers? Yes, indeed. You are now tuned in to the baddest motherfucking podcast in the universe. We give absolutely no fucks, no shits, and we don't apologize. Yes, that can only mean you are listening to the Behind the Baller podcast. I am Ben Baller, not Ben Humble. A.K.A. the Korean John Cusack, A.K.A. the Asian Liam Neeson. I am the original Don Mega Washed Lord. Was really, really, really good. <laughs> if you notice a little extra kimchi spice in this intro, well, it ain't by accident. We got the motherfucking wolf in the motherfucking building. Miles, can you please ring the alarm? This is not a test. We got Jordan Belfort in the building. Yes, the Wolf of Wall Street is on this episode of Behind the Baller podcast. But check game. Um, Before we get started, man, my heart goes out to everyone in Australia. As you can see, and if you've been living under a fucking sombrero, as you know, if you have any kind of phone or the news or whatever it may be, um, the whole fucking entire continent's on fire. Something like three quarters of the continent is literally on fire, and it's been on fire. Over half a billion animals have died. They're saying over a billion animals will die when this is all done with. Um, this is some other shit. To be honest, I don't even know what to really say. Um I've had two or three days or more to think about what to say. And I decided right now at the dome piece, like, yo, let me just talk about it. You know, um, I've donated to the cause. Um, you can too. Don't have a specific place. You can. I went on my friend Ruby Neely's page and I saw um, a donation link there. But, um, you know, it, it's not that hard. You can literally find something legit uh, and, and figure it out. But more importantly, listen, man, they're going to need a lot more than money and prayers it's a just a really shitty situation, and and I mean, God help them. You know, this is just just crazy. Um, in other news, uh, I am proud to say that I am one step closer to being less washed, and I got myself an Echelon stationary bike. It's supposed to be one of the best fucking stationary bikes out there. I've never fucking owned a stationary bike. I've definitely gotten fucking washed up to to even get a stationary bike, but my wife is gonna use it too. I'm sure. But what this means is I'm going to exercise. Now, you know, I got a BMX bike and, and I was riding around, you know, my neighborhood and shit like that. But this is like different. Like I'm going to fuck around and use this three to four times a week at least. Um, I need to desperately drop 10 pounds fast. But ideally, I should drop 20 and keep 20 off for at least, you know, for as long as I fucking can for many years. Um, and I can do it. But really, I've just had no desire to. I finally just fucking, I, I just, I said, you know what? There's no way I'm buying new jeans, uh, new pants. You know what I'm saying? Um, my acne jeans are 34 slim. I refuse to go to a 35 and not going to a 36. Um, back in the day, I used to rock a 36 and a 38, but sagging big and baggy and shit. Nah, fam. I'm turning 47 in two weeks and I don't need to get sexy, none of that, but I need to stop fucking around. All right. And as I'm saying this, just two hours ago, I had a fucking chicken Phillies tea steak and um, and a soda, and the cheesesteak was so fucking good. This shit, it, I just this shit's gotta stop. And uh, you know the Dust Brothers, uh, Jordan and Miles, they play pickup games, uh, basketball games at this gym, um, in like the Miracle Mile District uh, in this uh, Jewish community center. I used to actually we used to play AAU or not Slam and Jam games there, and I just made a goal. And I was like, you know, in the next year or two, I got to at least make it to one of these games. And then to take it even to another level, I need to hit up my boy Lethal Shooter to get my fundamental skills back. Um, I think the shot, everything's still there. It's just to get all my just, you know, to get that ex- extra English in my step, all the, just the, the basics, you know. 
I think I still have all the other shit, but I don't think my body's moving as fast as my mind does. But anyways, what that means is I need to get that green tea extract, that CLA, and that L-carnitine. That right there, you may want to rewind this a second here. All right, That combination right there, taken properly, all right, one to two times a day depending on, on the dosage, that exact combination of those three supplements right there along with 8 to 12 minutes of the right cardio. Listen, I was doing about 10 minutes of cardio three to four times a week, and there are people who were doing two hours or an hour a day, and it couldn't compare to my 10 minutes because I was targeting at a certain heart rate, okay? That shit dead ass got me to lose 53 pounds in just less than three months. No cap. Not fucking playing with you guys. I'm dead ass serious. I literally, in 2008, to two, you know, right, right, uh, the end of 2008, I dropped 53 motherfucking pounds, and that was 90 percent of why. On top of that, obviously, my diet was on point. I had a very low carb intake, but all that shit, it got it got me crisp. Um, I got a little loopy after a little while because I really went a long time without carbs, very little carbs. I'm talking about 45 grams, which is like two slices of bread in an entire 24-hour period, and I was doing that for six months. At a certain point, it actually makes your breath smell funny and all this other stuff. I was just on some other shit. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, I don't get excited these days off of like buying luxury items or like, you don't see me buying like Louis bags and Goyarch anymore. It's just not my thing. I'm not even that really hyped off cars as much anymore. I mean, I do, you know, I, I have an obsession with them, but it's like, it's not the same or whatever. Um, you definitely don't see me going out buying Gucci clothes and things like that. That's just not me at all whatsoever. Um, I'll stick to something I think that's an essential, but like, you know, unfortunately I cannot fit into, uh, St. Laurent, even my, sl- listen, if you buy an SK, yo, it, I don't know if I could ever wear an SK again, right? But the SL, St. Laurent SL, Slim Jean, I, I might, but you know, it's just like some of the clothes, I, it's starting to get to the point where I'm like, all right, man, like, you know, I can't wear sweats all the fucking time. But anyways, what I do get excited about is shit that like is like things that are better for my oral hygiene all right and even like any kind of like hygienic product i not to the point where i'm getting like into skincare and shit like that but just like certain things like this is where i know i'm just fucking weird now right but oral hygiene is so fucking important now, obviously you've seen i have perfect white teeth uh thanks to my man dr wahab but i've mentioned before your dental health is a very good look at your overall health, all right? So with that said, all right, I actually do use the Quip toothbrush system that I've mentioned on the podcast, you know, recently. Quip is one of the sponsors of the Behind the Baller podcast, and uh, I actually do use their their system. I've just started recently using it, and it's legit, Um the case it comes with, it's like a little tube. It's fuck, It's perfect for travel. And I never, never thought about it. And you know when it comes to travel, I do not fuck around. Most of the products that I've sold on the Ben Baller brand side have been travel products because I think traveling is, you know, definitely aspirational. And it's something, you know, I travel a lot. Um, I have an overnight bag at any given moment by my front door. Like if I have to go somewhere, boom, it's already ready to go. With chargers, everything, you know. And I have two separate toiletry bags that I use on a regular basis, you know, um, I have one for like the one, two day trips. And then I have the other one for four day to two week trips. So I always stay ready. So I never have to get ready. All right. So I can say this with no joke, with no fucking check behind me, nothing. Quip is for sure my favorite toothbrush to date that I've ever had, I've ever used. Okay. So if you want to try it out, make sure you do go to get quip.com forward slash baller g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com forward slash baller um use my discount code and um you can hear more of the details about it my wife uses like a hundred dollar electric toothbrush and she lives and dies by it listen whatever she hasn't used a quip yet i'm actually going to get her one but uh quip shits on it period you don't got to go anywhere to get it like the ad says they ship to you it's like a subscription service so you could just have that shit always sent to you and it's just it's fucking convenient i mean i got one i was like oh shit 
I said, it's time to, to switch. There's beeping noises. There's all kinds of stuff. It's just, it's really the most on-point toothbrush there is. Um, I have seen them at Target, so they're getting popular, but fuck all that. Here at Behind the Baller, we set trends early. I tell y'all what's warm before it gets hot. All right? Now, speaking of traveling, <sighs> um, I made a broken promise to my wife and my family that I wouldn't travel as much this year, and I've already been out of town in 2020 as it is. And now um, I'm headed to Dallas tomorrow for my boy Ed's wedding. Shout out to my World Star uh, Hip Hop family. He's the president of World Star Hip Hop. And um, honestly, to tell you the truth, I have no idea. It's, it's been a minute. I can't think how long. But it, I've been to Dallas in the last decade. I just have no idea what the fuck I'm going to do in Dallas while I'm kind of waiting in between the wedding and stuff. I don't know what that. There's really no itinerary. I don't know. Um, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to a bar and drinking. And I know Dallas got a lot of strip clubs. I'm not going to strip clubs. I'm just not really. That's just not my thing. Unless if I am in Miami, then yeah, I'll hit 11 and I'll hit Tootsie's. But anywhere else, like Vegas, or anything, I'm, just, I'm just over strip clubs. I just can't. And I used to be fucking obsessed with strip clubs. Anyways, before I get to mention, um, every time that I've drank in the last year, I hate myself. Now, a lot of people, you know, even in their 30s, they get really shit-faced. Like, oh, man, I just can't drink like I used to. That didn't happen until like my late 30s. And then, I, you know, my wife was like, oh, Ben doesn't drink. She tells all my friends, tells all her friends, her family, oh, Ben doesn't drink. She don't know I used to be a fucking damn near an alcoholic. And because this is the thing. They say people don't change or whatever. Just understand that she doesn't know how much I really did love to drink. And because I can't be that person, it's like the incredible. I turn into a whole different person. And there's no way. It, a divorce is one thing, but jail time is a whole nother thing. Like she doesn't get the person I used to be when I used to be with Jonas. I was on some whole other shit. And just it just didn't work out. And it's not going to work out for being married and being a father. Um, obviously, after I drink the next day, like when I drink for real, I just can't get my shit together. And uh, pretty much at this point, I'm only drinking Japanese whiskey and sipping it only and pretty much tequila. Now, I know for over a decade, I've promoted champagne so fucking heavy. For years, I've promoted champagne. But now, I swear to God, I'd rather fucking eat quinoa than drink champagne. And I hate quinoa. I'd rather eat toothpaste than fucking than drink champagne. I, I don't know what it is. I may get rid of all my rare bottles of champagne soon, too. Even though they only serve as strictly decorative items in the man cave. Um, I just don't want to promote headaches. It's just, I don't know what it is. But I will say that ta- I love the fucking taste of Moet Nectar Imperial Rosé. You know, the gold bottle of Moet. That's my favorite fucking champagne. I'll be like, oh, it's the hood champagne. But it's still Moet. It's still, you know, Moet Chandon. It's fucking delicious as a motherfucker. But again, the headaches. I'm good, man. So when he's back to traveling, I don't know how the fuck I got so sidetracked on drinking. Um, I'm in Dallas tomorrow. Um, I don't know. I might hit a fucking mall. I don't know what the fuck it is. Me and malls and liquor stores and convenience stores, I just that's just my thing. I, I love convenience stores, drug stores, and fucking um, malls. It's just sad. And I don't go to a mall fucking shop necessarily. I'll buy trinkets and really random shit. But um, I head to Green Bay on Sunday for the big game. Seahawks versus the motherfucking Packers. Uh, my cousin Rex, who I own my Seahawks season tickets with, he decided to fly out with me. It is no fucking joke trying to find a flight. Now, this motherfucker went and hit Amex, you know, concierge services. He hit kayak, hit Expedia, nothing. And I told the motherfucker, I said, listen, dog, the fucking entire area of Green Bay, the hotels have been sold out for two weeks. Can't do shit, all right? So stop playing. Finally, he got real lucky. got like literally the last flight out. Um, the city of Green Bay has a population, the entire area of Green Bay has a population of 105,000 people, Okay. The stadium itself holds 80,750 people. So just the fucking stadium already holds 80% of the goddamn population. So you already know when it's game day, it's not a fucking joke. These motherfuckers don't, it's a whole different level of fucking lifestyle without there, you know. Them cheeseheads don't fuck around. Again, like I said, every single hotel, I don't give a fuck, the two-star hotel, one-star hotel, motels, all sold out. It's just impossible to get a, a flight into or out of Green Bay. I got my shit immediately after the Seahawks won, and I couldn't even get a, ho- a flight 
out of Green Bay. I'm flying into Green Bay. I couldn't fucking fly out of Green Bay. Thank God to a follower, because I've only been to Green Bay once. Shout out to my dog, uh, Ryan Grant, and uh, my boy, Charles Woodson. Um, thank God, though, to a follower. Forgot his username, but I would posted on my story. Um, I'm flying out of Appleton Airport, Wisconsin. Appleton, Wisconsin, which is about 45 minutes away from my hotel. And um, I- I'm fucking going, you know? Fuck it. I don't know how good we're going to be next year, whatever it may be. I got to embrace the shit while I can, while I have the help, while, I have, while I'm just able to. God willing, we win and beat the Packers in their home field, um, which that means we will most likely fly back to San Francisco um, the following weekend because I don't think the Vikings are going to do it. They're just not going to happen. If they do, oh my fucking God, amazing. So the following weekend, from this weekend means we we would play the Niners in San Francisco if we win. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to go to the game at Levi Stadium. Um, I'll keep it a buck. I've talked so much shit for the last 10 years and more. I, for the last seven legit years just on Instagram. People are like, oh, you fucking back. Shut the fuck up, you stupid, dumb fucking idiots. One more fucking time, you stupid, dumb fucks. Okay. We didn't win the fucking chip seven years ago. And over that, there's fucking posts of me talking shit about the Niners there, okay? So it doesn't even fucking matter. Bottom line is that I've definitely put a target on my head. And um, it's not that I'm scared. It's the fact that I'll just end up in jail. Like 1,000% I'm going to jail. Is the target on me, fine. Um, But that doesn't mean that like, you know, me talking shit and everything else, whatever. You throwing something or you you starting something with me, that brings up a whole different level of Liam Neeson out of me. You know, I never started. Talking shit is different, one thing, right? Boom, you gotta be able to talk shit back. But if y'all wanna get into a physical altercation, you know, it gets it gets serious. Like I said, man, I'll fucking dedicate the rest of my life. Stop making jewelry, stop doing anything else, and just focus all my shit on fucking your whole entire life up. That's me, I'm that petty. So anyways, I'll be watching the game from my hotel suite in San Francisco because <laughs> next week after I get back from Green Bay, I have to fly to Sacramento on Thursday for a photo shoot. And then that night I'm going to drive to San Francisco and I'm going to stay there until Monday. Just fuck man, this traveling. And then when I get back on Monday, on Wednesday, I shoot a commercial in Los Angeles. As soon as I finish that commercial, which will be late afternoon, early evening, I'm going to drive down to San Diego and I'll be there for two and a half days, almost three days, until the 25th, in which I think on the 25th, I might have a secret birthday party with my homie Dorothy Wang. Um, it'll be at a club. I'll, I'll probably announce it. I don't know. I'll figure it out. But I am going to have a friends and family, small, low-key, 25, 30-person B-Day party. And I would say 15 to 20 of that is like family. And I'm going to have a birthday party that weekend of my birthday. It'll be super chill. Um, I'm definitely not going to the Super Bowl the weekend after. That's just not my cup of chai. Uh, I hate Super Bowl games. Um, going there, it was just, there's just, it, I've been three times and all of them sucked. But uh, yeah, you know, I'll definitely have a super lit Super Bowl party at my house for sure with catering and all. But um, I'm flying all over, man. This is just fucking crazy, you know. Uh, I'll be in Tokyo at some point in the next 60 days along with Hong Kong in the next 90 days, um, Korea and Philippines. Uh, that's just going to have to be some time later. Uh, I was supposed to be in Dubai next month for an appearance and for another collaboration. Uh, yeah, that's not going to happen because this stupid motherfucker, Donald Trump, threatened um, all this other crazy shit. And I told you before, um, we are pretty much at war terms. I mean, I don't know when we're actually going to go to war, but it's, I don't think it's world war, but whatever, but we're, we're not on good terms. And, and Iran has already said that they're going to, if we fuck with them anymore, they're going to bomb Dubai. Um, yeah, I'm good, man. Empty threats or not, I'm not going to Dubai. I'm, I'm chilling. I'm good. I don't even care if I never go again. I've been five times. I'm straight. Um, but I will be in New York City for me and my wife's anniversary at the end of February. Um, it'll be the first time that all three kids get to visit the Rotten Apple uh, I can't wait to see my kids in Central Park, like Kaya, and a fucking like one of the little chariot things. Um, I cannot wait to take my kids, especially Ryder, to Serendipity and get an ice cream sundae. No nuts, no fucking peanuts. Um, speaking of which, oh, um, my wife found a doctor who specializes in curing kids, um, people of nut allergies. 
and it takes about 10 months or so, but she's like 90, 95% successful and people who had it, whatever she, we just began the treatment um, very recently last week. And so I pray this works out. It will change all of our lives. Well, in my family, it will change our lives forever and fucking ever. Like I will literally have one less enormous stress ball off my mind and body to think about if this works. So I just, I fucking hope it does. Uh, back to some jewelry shit. I'm almost ready to set some stones into Kid Cudi's piece. I've done some, um, well, my diamond setter has done some stuff on the Michael Pave side. That is not my specialty. But the beauty of it is this is that I can work myself late at night, early morning, whenever the fuck I want to. I know exactly how much time I need to put into this. But once we get into the final stages, like the final polish and the rhodium, that's when I really get down. That's when shit gets real gang related and that's just my specialty. You know, that's when my hands get real gang, you know, that's why people are like, oh, let me see your fucking hands. Listen, these are my hands, motherfucker. And I get manicures often. My hands don't look that great. They look as good as they can. But, uh, and it's funny too, people are like, oh man, your hands always shake and blah, blah, what is that? You know, I have a adrenal issue and um, I've had it since I was 12 years old. And it's always been that way. People are like, oh, shanky, whatever. This, I've gotten blood work. I've done everything done. This is an adrenaline issue with me personally. I've always had my hands shaking. It's got nothing to do. I don't do fucking, I don't do coke. You know, I don't do any speed. I don't do any, um, any, any of those type of drugs. Anyways, the piece will have some man- enamel work on it. So, you know, even though my hand is not super steady, my hand is super precise. I can't wait to show you this piece. I can't wait to hit Tokyo to go over my next collaboration with Murakami. I'm so fucking hyped about it. Don't know what we're going to really, we don't, I don't know if it's going to be a complex I'm not sure, but our next collaboration is going to be lit. Uh, speaking of collabs, um, speaking of tech collabs, speaking of Tokyo and speaking of art, I had lunch with my new favorite person yesterday, um, Lauren Sai. She was, and maybe still is kind of a model, I think. I mean, she definitely was a model. I don't think she's, she kind of still is a model, but she's an actress. Um, she's on a Netflix show. I don't know. You have to Google it. I'm not really positive, but she's always been an artist. And uh, I don't know exactly what I'd call her art, but she's dope as fuck. Um, she's Hapa, which obviously is Asian, and, and I fuck with her heavy. We met via uh, my designer con family, my boy Ben and Kai. And I just love her entire energy and vibe. It, it, she's just got a super fly personality. She's crazy talented. And we are discussing a possible collaboration, um, obviously jewelry. Uh, and I don't want to force it at all whatsoever. It just has to flow like some open meridians. But I think, I think it'll work out. We ate at uh, um, my boy Nick's uh, restaurant. I finally got to check out my boy Nick's restaurant is called Nick's on Beverly, N-I-C apostrophe S. Um, my boy Nick is a like a famous vegan. Um, he's been a vegan for a long time, longer than most people. I remember the day he became a vegetarian uh, was like end of summer, 1994. I literally was there the day he became a vegetarian and then he became vegan um, like 20 years ago, whatever. Anyways, this is a 100% plant-based vegan restaurant and it's a nice restaurant. So it's like a fancy, somewhat fancy restaurant, but it's, you know, you don't have to dress in black tie or nothing. I'm just saying it's a fancier. It's not like it's a fucking Chipotle style. This is a, a real legit restaurant, real chef cooked plant-based food. Um, there are a few places like this in Los Angeles. I have not seen any in New York or SF on this level. But um, again, this is all vegan food only and no disrespect to Gracias Madre or Crossroads. This is for sure the best vegan food restaurant in the country, if not the world. Um, because I haven't seen anything, but I mean, from what I've been to, um, and I've been to quite a few in here in LA, uh, food is phenomenal. Their avocado crispy rice, that fucking ponzu sauce is so goddamn good. Their fucking gnocchi was, was lit. Avocado tacos. Uh, Lauren had this, um, tofu bowl. I didn't, wasn't crazy about what that shit looked like, but I'm sure my wife would love it. Whatever. Anyways, listen, congrats to my bro, Nick Adler. One of the guys who I actually owe a lot of success, a lot, my, my, my success too. Um, him and his father were such big parts of my come up in life. Not only in my music career, but just in life in general. Um, back to the food again. The food at Nick's on Beverly is fucking super yummy. Speaking of yummy, my bro Justin Bieber just dropped his new single, Yummy. And uh, he announced yesterday to the world that he has Lyme disease. Um, 
reading a little bit about it, it brought some sadness to me. Uh, it's obviously a great thing that he's bringing so much uh, awareness to it. And uh, I know he's going to get the best help and all the help he needs, but fuck. <sighs> this just can't be an easy thing to deal with. I read up on it. It's um, There's not really a cure. Um, I'm praying for my bro. This is the craziest fucking thing. I had to just, this is nuts. Um, and then speaking of uh, white boys with swag, uh, Tom Hanks' son, Chet Hanks, a.k.a. Shaba Hanks, made viral news with his uh, his impression of a, of a Rastafari on the red carpet of the Golden Globes. And honestly, listen, man, he's been getting fucking shit on by a bunch of people. Even my boy Lil Duvall kind of got it and everything else. And at the same time, it's kind of low-key hate, but at the same time, like, you know, man, as, as much all the shit he's getting, I went to his page and I, and I checked out some of his tweets and everything else, whatever, and just checked out his whole vibe, whatever. And um, my sister used to used to style Tom and you know, he's got an older brother or whatever. And uh, I don't know, man, I, I slid, I just, for some, I slid in the dude's DMs. I heard a song, it wasn't bad, it was pretty good. And um, the cool thing is immediately he knew who I was. Um, he showed crazy love back. And um, if anyone understands the Hollywood entitled rich kids, you know, the, the celebrity's kids, the celebrity's son. Nobody understands that better than me. You know, I've dealt with so many of these from growing up with them to on a business level, whatever. And uh, I read some of his tweets, which don't mean shit, right? You know, between, between you know, fictitious shit, whatever. But I met some, read some of his tweets and I just kind of like went over his, you know, just, just looked over his page and looked certain things and you can't judge anybody but I, I can I can just tell when someone has a decent head on their shoulders and he's you know obviously he's been heavily influenced by hip hop and black culture and that's okay listen I can tell 100,000% he doesn't mean any harm by it he has no derogatory energy towards black people or hip hop like this. people are just being fucking overly hate, hateful and whatever but he says some dope shit on his twitter which um, he hasn't been active on in over a year. But I don't know. I, ho I hope he gets his day outside these jokes and shit, you know, whatever. Um, regardless of how big his dad is, uh, through, like, you know, people I've talked to, I heard he actually went real hard the opposite direction on getting as much as he could get done without his dad's help or his mom's help. Um, his mom's Rita Wilson. Uh, I don't know. But speaking of the Golden Globes, um, I know I said in the weekend wrap-up, who gives a fuck about them? But it was pretty dope because my sister... My older sister, Jean, she made some waves. Um, she styles Jason Momoa, you know, um, Aquaman. And uh, he went to the Golden Globes rocking a Rick Owens wife beater. Like he wore a fucking wife beater to the black tie fucking Golden Globes. And he crushed it. He killed it. You know, and it was fucking dope. It was like, it just, no one said shit. And, and, and you know, people were definitely shocked and whatever. But my sister doesn't fuck around ever. She's so fucking versatile with her styling. It was dope to see her name pop up on Yahoo News, CNN, all that shit. She comes from the real super OG traditional Hollywood way of publicity and just the way she works and everything else. It ain't ever been on some fucking greasy shit on some like, um, there's obviously no nepotism. My sister built her own name by herself. So this whole social media thing is super new to her. It's something she's still getting used to. I love my sister, of course, you know. Uh, so anyways, listen, guys, I know I've been killing with you guys with the intro but let's get to the motherfucking wagyu let's get to that a7 jordan belfort all right i rarely get jitters and the only times i've ever got jitters have been when i've come in contact that i ain't talking about shaking someone's hand saying hi and i'm talking about sitting down and really interacting and building with some big dogs legends the real definition of legend i'm talking about no motherfucking youtube star or none of that shit i'm talking about prince I'm talking about Michael Jackson. I'm talking about Michael Jordan, Mike Tyson, all right? And same goes with the wolf, all right? The moment I entered his office, I was greeted very kindly by his employees. They were super hyped, it seemed, you know? And not only that, it's just they, they actually knew who I was, you know? And it seemed like they respected me for my craft. And um, again, I, I had jitters like a motherfucker. I was like, damn, man, should I take a Xanax? Should I, should I smoke some weed? And no, I just was kind of like, you know, I had two coffees and um um I, I was just like i was low-key nervous you know and i had to just kind of like you know i had to get in my breathing technique and before the cameras went on you know i was chit-chatting with jordan we you know we shot this shit for like five ten minutes he was starting to get a little dirty i can tell he's like wanting to get he, he seemed real busy i don't want to fucking you know waste his time it, it's taken what 
two different reschedules to get this going. And um, all of my life, I've always thought, fuck, you know, I need to make my life into a movie. You know, not all my life. I'm saying in retrospect, in the last 15 years, I've said, man, my life is, or my life was a movie 15 years ago before I became a jeweler. My life was fucking crazy. And I know a lot of people say this shit like, oh man, what about this dude? You know, he got out of the hood and played ball and this and whatever. This guy became an actor. Listen, fuck, I should bring up Kevin Hart's fucking documentary. I'm not, not a fan of Kevin Hart at all whatsoever, but his doc was crazy. Um, but anyways, I think what I've done compared to any of these people I've seen, what I've done with what was given to me is so much more than 99.9% of the stories of all the craziest celebrities I've ever met, except for Mike Tyson and, of course, Mr. Jordan Belfort. Um, Jordan's life was fucking insane. I mean, I can't even believe he's still alive. I'm sure most of you guys saw Martin Scorsese's movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. And listen, we get raw as fuck in this fucking in this interview. Unfiltered, no condom, straight gangster Mac. For 75 minutes, all right? So without further ado, fine fucking Lee, Miles, Jordan, can we get some intro music from the Great Lakey for the Wolf? Let's go. Yo, man, you are tuned in to another episode of Behind the Baller. We have probably the biggest motherfucking guest in the history of the show, even though the show's new. But regardless, this is a fucking legend in the motherfucking house. We got Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. What's good, Jordan? <laughs> What's up, buddy? <laughs> Yo, man, let's get right into it, man. Let's go. Um, you're from the Bronx, man. Well, actually, Just, Queens, but, you know, we're kindred spirits, Bronx, Queens. We share a day together. We're actually Brooklyn, Queens Day, so. But, yeah, I'm right over the bridge from the Bronx. They border each other. Okay, what part of Queens then, man? Bayside, Queens. Oh, okay, Bayside, okay. Yeah, Flushing, Bayside. I'm, I'm actually from Bayside, and I lived there till I was, uh, my early, like, 21, and then I moved into the city, then out to Long Island, but I was in New York my whole life, born and bred. Okay, yeah. reason why I know Bayside is so funny, I'm a huge Jerky Boys fan, That that those guys, and they would always talk about Bayside Queens. <laughs> and like, oh, the Bayside Raiders, whatever. And then Flushing, <laughs> obviously, I'm Korean, so Flushing is 90% Korean right now. Bayside is a huge Korean population now, too, as oh, well. Is? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. Well, how did being from, like, um, being from there, how'd that, like, how'd that shape you, man, at a young age? I, I think that Growing up in base, it was interesting. So, you know, we were middle class to lower middle class, right? Highly educated. We had enough money, so we didn't want for basic necessities, but we knew how little we had. So, like, we always said, wow, you know, one day we're going to get rich and move out to Long Island where the people had money. So, you know, I wasn't so poor that I didn't see wealth around me. I saw wealth on the other side of the rainbow. I uh, had a great education, but didn't have the things that I wanted, but everything I needed growing up. And I think that was a big part um, of, of really shaping my perspective on what it means to be successful on why certain people aren't successful like for instance my own parents i had really amazing parents brilliant hard-working educated and broke didn't have money like you know they were both professionals cpas and i say broke mean they lived essentially paycheck to paycheck with some tiny bit of savings and what they saved they tried to you know you know just that, that traditional old depression era mentality right. life right and then i was about maybe 12 years old, 11 years old, I wanted my parents to buy me a dirt bike for my birthday. I think it was $130 back then. I'm like, you know, mom, dad, I want a dirt bike. They're like, we can't afford it. I'm like, what do you mean you can't afford it? You're like, you're, you're both accountants. They're like, no, let us show you. And they actually showed me what they made, what they was. And I was like, fucking appalled. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, that's all you. I was like, I felt offended by it. I'm like, you guys are that smart. You work that hard and you only make that. And I said, you know what? There's something missing from the equation. And as a couple of years went by and I got a bit more worldly as a 13, 14, 15, I said, okay, there's a few things missing. Number one, they're completely risk averse. They never take any chances. Right. Number two, they have no entrepreneurial mindset whatsoever. They just work for other people, paycheck, end of the week, that's that. And number three, they thought selling 
and marketing were inherently evil. They were manipulative. So they were against how proud they are of me, right? Yeah. So I said, you know, I get it. There's other things that have to be in place here besides just education and hard work. I mean, I'm, I come from a Korean family. So first of all, the way you just broke that down fucked me up right now because I feel like I grew up around enough wealth. We grew up in a whatever part of town, but I did see the wealthy people. My mom worked for someone that was wealthy. I saw that. So I saw enough to where I was like, okay, we could eat, we could do this. And that was, that was right. the way you broke that down. It was crazy. Um, you knew how you you had enough to know how little you had. <laughs> true, and you know we lived in a in an eight hundred square foot you know five people in eight hundred square foot apartment, but it was because it was a better part of town, I guess. But my father, he got a PhD. My father had been broke all his fucking life. My my dad never never did shit. He made never more made more than thirty thousand dollars in a year. Um, my mom, on the other hand, for a while she got her hustle on, and she had no real smart. She just worked really fucking hard. Doing what? Uh, she sewed dresses. She was a contractor okay. for a company called Cherokee. If you remember Cherokee, like sure the brand. Do. And so it was a big brand. And she put the sewing machine in the hands of the people who owned Forever 21. And they became billionaires off. A lot of, a lot of Korean people were dress contractors and sewing contractors. And my mom kind of regrets that. I'm like, fuck it. You know, it is what it is. But I always had to hustle mentality. It's just crazy. The way you broke that down was nuts. Um, what did you want to be when you were growing up, though? Did you know? So I wanted to be rich. Really, I mean, I, if you would have asked me when I, even like at the age of 18, or no, t even 21, when I graduated from college, if you said, what do you want to do for a living? I want to be rich for a living. I mean, I didn't really know. So I actually, believe it or not, I spent one day in dental school because from the time I was two years old sitting in the high chair, my mom was spoon feeding me applesauce. She'd say, the only noble way to be wealthy, you have to be a doctor, a dentist, like fucking hypnosis, a doctor. As the applesauce is going yeah. in, right? I'm like, doctor, right now, that's deep shit she's implanting in me, like nobility, well, doctor, dentist. Now, I, when I was making the decision, doctor or dentist, she said, I can't go to school. She's a very good student. So I graduated, you know, high in my class in college, right? And uh, I said, I can't go to medical school. It's eight more years. I'll kill myself. I want to be rich tomorrow. <laughs> I said, I'll go to dental school. It's only four more years. I'll still be Dr. Bell for what? Dentists get rich. In fact, my uncle was a dentist. He had a lot of money, right? So I go to dental school. I apply, get in, right? First day of dental school, dean of the school, stands up in front of 105 kids, right? And I'm looking around saying, All right, so far, they look pretty bright on bush tails. So far, so good. Dean has a white jacket on, white hair, pretty dental looking. I'm like, all right, this seems okay. He goes, welcome to the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. It's like the orientation to all of us. Because yeah. you should be proud to be here. Dentistry is a wonderful profession. You're going to be a pillar of privilege. Just give yourself a round of applause. Everyone's like, yeah. I'm like, all right, yeah, whatever, right? He goes, but let me say this. The golden age of dentistry is over. If you're here to make a lot of money, you're probably in the wrong place. I'm like, what the fuck? And I stood up and I left. I dropped out my first day and never went back. That was my only sort of veering off that line to being an entrepreneur. So I you know, had a few months where I actually hid down in Maryland and I couldn't bear to break news with my mother. And finally, my money ran out and I, um, and I answered a blind ad in the paper. And that's what got me into the sales world. And the rest, as they say, is history. Right. So what was your first business venture then? Well, well, my first business venture really was, I mean, I was one of those born entrepreneurs since I emerged my mother's womb at the age of eight. I had a paper <laughs> out at the age of 10. I was shoveling driveways after snowstorms. At the age of 12, I was doing kids' magic shows. <laughs> and I hit it big when I was 16. I started going down to Jones Beach in New York and right. selling Ice's Blanket. The blanket, I made a freaking fortune. I mean, I was making about twenty to 30000 per summit in the beginning, ultimately as much as 60,000 a summer Jesus when I was in high school, Christ. making bets a lot. It's like a quarter, 300,000 a year now, right? Yeah. So I always was entrepreneurial, but my first business after I dropped out of dental school was selling meat and seafood door to door. I had answered a blind ad in the newspaper and it was sales, meat and fish, home freezer plants, like just knocking on people's doors. And my first day on the job, I just shattered the company record. I was a born <laughs> salesman. And the first week I destroyed it. About two weeks after I said, hey, well, I'm working for these guys for a while. I'll just open up my own business. I opened up my own meat and seafood company. I was 21. By the time I was 22, I had 26 trucks on the road. I was Holy making shit. a ton of money, I thought. But I was actually making all the mistakes that young entrepreneurs make. I was overexpanding. I was undercapitalized. I was growing on credit. Before I knew it, I was out of business, went bankrupt to 23. Oh, and that's shit. what brought me down to Wall Street. That was going to be my next fucking question. You know that's what I mean? Like, like I, I lost my money, had to go down to Wall Street, and, and I had to essentially sell myself a job because my resume wasn't looking that good at this point. I was a dental school dropout who just declared bankruptcy. I'm like, hire me, right? So, you know, when I went into this for my interview, I actually started pitching the guy a stock. 
like right in the job interview. And the guy's like, oh, oh, oh. he goes, Jesus, I never, never met anyone like you. He goes, it's crazy that the guy was interviewing me. He goes, you know, either one of two things are going to happen to you. Either you're going to become the most famous broker in Wall Street history, you're going to end up in jail. Well, the guy's a fucking genius. He was right <laughs> on both accounts, <laughs> right? And he hires me and the rest now really is history, right? I mean, the stock market always came easy to you. Is that what it, like... As far well, as the stocks know, and numbers. And again, so what I was as a stockbroker, you have to distinguish here between being a stockbroker versus being an analyst or an investment banker. There's so many different nuances to Wall Street. A stockbroker is essentially a glorified salesperson. You're a retail stockbroker is selling stocks to individuals and he's getting the recommendations from either analysts or whatever source. So you're not really, you're just a salesperson. And it was perfect for me because I was an amazing, I was the best salesperson ever, right? So I... I worked for about six or seven months as an assistant because you had to get licensed back then. You couldn't call anybody. And finally, after my six or seven months of you know working for this other broker and just watching and listening to them, it was my first day. And I go in the office my first day. It turns out to be Black Monday, October 19th, 1987. I watch in shock and awe as the market tanks 508 points in a single day. Yeah. And just like that, the firm I worked for, Ella Rothschild, which had been in business for over 100 years, on my first day shuts down. And I'm out of a job now, again. So that's how it, you know, and that's what brought me then to the lower price, to the penny stocks. I couldn't get a job. So I took a, I had answered another ad now in a local paper. It was for selling, you know, locally. Oh, go work for this company selling stocks. I answered the ad and it was penny stocks. That's how it started. I mean, what do you remember about Black Friday? Black Friday. Black- Black. black Monday, though. What do you remember about that? Is there anything well, like? Well, I remember it was a Black Friday before the market actually <laughs> before the market before the market tanked on Monday. It was a foreboding Friday. They, it was like the market. You have to remember the price of the. Now remember the market back then was two thousand three hundred something like that. Right. Twenty three hundred, one tenth or less, less than a tenth, right? So on the Friday before, it went down like ninety five points. Which was mad, it's like a thousand points. And everyone's like, oh, yeah. fuck, but it's going to come back on Monday. And then Monday morning, it's like from the first second the market opened, it was like a cliff. I just, I'll never forget because normally the paradigm was when you're calling on the phone as a stockbroker, you're trying to reach business owners, you're trying to get through the secretaries or the assistants, right? Very difficult to do, but you can do it. You, just, you know, you by force of will, by numbers, and by being a bit ingenious in how you phrase things and your tonality, right? Normally, if you made 250 dials per day, you might get through to 40 business owners. And of those 40, maybe five to 10 will say, you yes, yeah, send me some information, right? On that day, if you made 250 calls, you got through the 245 business owners. You know why? They're like, ha ha, you fucking idiot. You're on Wall Street. People would all want to talk to you that day, but they were just laughing in your face. Yeah, you greedy bastard. Look at you. It was un- so my first day. I was speaking to everybody. I called. They wanted to talk to a broker because everyone was saying, what's, there was no internet back then. Yeah. So everyone was like, what's going on? Is there a crash? Ah, you're fucked, right? So it was, it was really weird. So I, I got to speak to all these people and it was so terrible because I remember I'm like, I watched these stocks that had been normally like Eastman Kodak had been 90. Now it's 30. It's like the best buy in the world. And I'm like, yesterday was 90, today's 30. It's a great, they're like, fuck you, click, you know? So it was, it was a tough day. And then I remember at the end of that day, the brokers were all walking around like, oh shit, the game is over. Oh my God, the game. I'm like, what do you mean the game's over? I didn't even get to play yet. I was a freaking slave for six months. What do you mean the game's over? Like, oh no, the game's over. And the front page of the newspaper, it was the, the, the headline was the death of Wall Street. All brokers will be cab drivers. See, you have to remember this, that on that particular day, no one knew that it was going to be a very short, downturn and then the market would come back and the economy would follow suit. People assumed there would be another Great Depression. Right. So on that particular day, you know, at the end, everyone was like, oh my God. The, people thought we were heading for another Great Depression. On the way home, I, at this point, I was taking the fucking bus to work. To this day, I never recover. I still can't get in the bus without having fucking a twitch for this day from the six months of taking the freaking bus. All right. I'll never forget. Normally, you know, you know, when you get on a bus... When you go to a store, there's like the general background noise of people just talking to each other. On that day on the bus, you could have heard a fucking pin drop. It was like dead silence. And oh, it was like shit, no man. one was under. So everybody in the free world knew that the market had crashed, that there was going to be a disaster in the economy. We were heading for a Great Depression. So everybody knew it except my first wife. She was a few wives ago. I haven't done that well in the wife department. But right. she was wife number one. She wasn't much of a news bug. 
wasn't really the sharpest tool in the shed. I loved her, but she wasn't a brain surgeon, right? So, like, you know, she's watching fucking Oprah all day and soap operas. So she just assumed that when I went to work that morning, like, it was a guarantee I was going to break the records. I was, I was the greatest salesman, even as a kid, right? Everyone said, right. oh, my God, you're going you're gonna to be the biggest broker ever, right? So when I walked in the door, we were so broke because, I, you know, I declared bankruptcy. I was on, you know, working slaves' wages. She'd taken our last $95 and bought a bottle of Dom Perignon to celebrate my first day as a broker. Oh, so when I walked man. in the door, she said, How'd you do? Did you break the record? And I was like, oh. I'm like, you didn't fucking hear. I'm like, I, and I collapsed and started crying in her arms. I, I, I took that ultimate shot that you take as an entrepreneur, as a successful, at least a success-oriented individual, and I, and, I, and I started to cry, and I was paralyzed. That day, I remember, I was like, when I got home, I was paralyzed with fear and uncertainty and, and just self-loathing, and I thought God was against me, the world was against me, nature was against me, whichever you believe in, and, and I yeah. was paralyzed. I couldn't move for about two hours. Because I didn't have more than two hours. I was broke. I couldn't right. pay the rent. Yeah. And after a couple hours of you know self pity, I we picked up the help wanted section, and we started looking for a job outside of Wall Street because Wall Street wasn't hiring, and that was that. And that was and I stumbled upon this ad that said you know part time full time stockbrokers. I'm like part time stockbrokers. It was on Long Island. Yeah. I'm like really? And when I, I called up the next morning, and they're like investor center. I'm like invest. What the fuck is invest? I'd heard. Morgan Stanley, JP, yeah. Modesta Center. And they said, yeah, come down for interviews. I went down there and that's the, one of the greatest scenes from the movie is when I walk into this dilapidated brokerage firm and there isn't a single thing in there that reeks of wealth, success, or Wall Street. It's like going back to the caveman days. They were just dialing on you know regular uh, you know, <laughs> rotary telephones, no computers on the desk. They were selling stocks, what's called the pink sheets. These yeah. are penny stocks. And I didn't, and they were cursing. They were dressed in jeans and sneakers. I come from like the mahogany panel walls of fucking LF Wall <laughs> Trout where we were selling IBM to fucking institutions, right? And I was like, what the fuck are you guys doing here? I'm like, oh, we sell penny stocks. And I'm like, what's a penny stock? I didn't know what it was even. Yeah. Did not know. And then when the guy showed me, I'm like, wow, these are real pieces of shit. I'm like, and he goes, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what is these two differences? And then he goes, oh, that's, it was like 10 cent bid, 20 cent offered. I'm like, that's a 50% spread. He goes, that's all commission. Yeah. I'm like, what? I'm like, no. Because on traditional Wall Street, if someone would send you a million dollars, You'd make maybe two thousand in commission on that, oh, right? Oh, I didn't know it was that small. Damn, it was okay. small. But you keep doing it again and again. It's yeah, very, yeah, very rapid, sure. right? And because people trade it out, right? And you make it in the buy and the sell. But it was small. If someone sent you a million dollars in this world, you'd keep half a million. Yeah. So I'm like, you mean to tell me that if if they send me a million bucks, I get to keep half? He's like, well, yeah, in theory, but it doesn't work that way because rich people don't buy penny stocks. So I'm like, why? He goes, because they don't. Because, you know, we call mailmen, we call average moms and dads, they put a few hundred dollars in. Now, at this point in time, normally, if I was myself, I would have said, wait a second, that doesn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to me. But I was so downtrodden at that moment. I just declared bankruptcy eight months before the market had crashed. I thought I had the Midas touch in reverse. Everything I touched turned to shit, basically, right? <laughs> so I was like, just, all right, all right, fine, I accept. Rich people don't, could I? Give me a list of the poor people. Just hiring that guy hired me, and he gave me a list. Uh, he gave me like index cards of people who had written in. They were poor, and he, he could pick one of these stocks. And I sat down. I wrote a script for a stock, and I'd heard all these things when I was training for six months. I didn't get to sell, but I kind of heard everything. I also had already trained salesmen in my meat business. I was a really great sales trainer already back then. And the first call I picked up and made, made as dialed. And as I started speaking, I noticed like something weird. Like as I'm pitching this first guy, I'm like. Why are there people are crowding around me? And by the time I was done, the entire office had stopped. They were all crowding around me with like recorders. And when I cut, I closed the first guy for like five grand, which was the biggest trade in penny stock history. And they're like, how the fuck did you do that? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we never heard anything like that. These guys were like, just buy the stock. But I was just really elegant, had this sort of way of selling, right? And that was really how it started. That first month, they made 50 grand. The second month, they made 100 grand. Three of, and all the kids started like listening to me and I was kind of mentoring them. And then about six months later, I had an opportunity to open up my own firm, uh, which I eventually, I delayed for a short time because of my failure. Uh, but, you know, I was maybe saying maybe I'm not meant to be an entrepreneur, but I broke through that and I started my own firm with eight people. And for about three or four months, I was calling average moms and pops. And then it hit me. I'm saying, wait a second. I went back to that first day. Why are we calling average moms and dads? And ultimately what I did is I cracked the code. I, I came up with this sort of niche market that was selling not penny stocks, but 5 to $10 stocks to the richest 1% of Americans. No one had ever tried it before. 
And when I tested the idea myself with my junior partner, Danny, from the, you know, the Joan Hill character, the results were so staggering. Like the first guy bought $120,000 worth and apologized for working so small. In that moment, in that moment, I knew. I said, oh my God. I, cause I looked at I saw these 12 morons working. He's, he's, he had 12 kids about 20 years old. The average IQ, Forrest Gump on three hits of acid, <laughs> basically, right? And I said, all I got to do is teach them how to call rich people and the rest will be history. But unfortunately, that turned out to be easier said than done. I tried to everything to teach these guys how to call rich people and close them. They couldn't do it. Yeah. And that's what led me to create this new system of selling, which ultimately became the whole basis of everything that happened after. In throughout your entire stock market career, did you ever want to like, like I don't know, invest and buy buildings, anything else? You oh, just... I did. Well, I did. I did a lot of stuff. Oh, shit. Okay. I, 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 I very quickly began... Um, with the one thing I didn't do much of is real estate, which I regret. I think I should have done a lot more yeah, of that. Yeah, but that, yeah. but but that's the. But I did very quickly go into what's called the merchant banking business. So merchant banking is basically the vertical integration of Wall Street. Where so Wall Street is about you're actually finding companies that exist that are already running, and you want to raise those companies' money so they could trade publicly on the exchange. That's Wall Street. What they do, they finance. It's investment banking, right? Right. But the vertical integration is where you go one step back, say, well, I actually want to own the companies too that I take public. So I started actually buying companies privately and starting them. And the biggest success I was Steve Madden shoes. Right. So Steve Madden, the movie version of the story is way off. The, the, in my book, I the real story of <laughs> Steve Madden was, so in the movie they say Steve Madden was the hottest shoe manufacturer. That's not true. Steve Madden was no one. He was a startup. A stone. Right. When I met Steve, and I love Steve, he's a brilliant guy. He was a stone cold startup. All right, he was very young, and he was best friends with my partner, Danny, right? Right. And he, he just was getting started. He asked me for a million dollars to start Steve Madden. And he just had one shoe that had not even sold. I mean, he was going around in his car, like, store to store, right? It's a great success story. And I, for, I said, okay, I'll give you a million dollars, and I want 85% of your company. And he's like, thank you. And he gave me 85% of his company. So the next day I turned around and sold off 35% of that for a million dollars. I ended up with 50% for free. Right. So I let, that's a very classic Wall Street deal. I laid off the risks. Now I own half of Steve Madden for free. I did that a hundred times with different companies. You name an industry, I've been in that business, um, you know, where I invested in these companies then to take them public, right? Nice. Steve Madden was the one that really did really well. And I give Steve tremendous credit for that. But when he came to me, he made a lot of, Errors. Like, for instance, he didn't need a million dollars. He could have used less. So he diluted himself. Also, he would have said to me, 85%, that's too much. Way too much. He sh he, I would have said, okay, I'll do 50 50. He never said it. He said, sure. Wait so a I second. took 85%. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. I'm tripping because you know what? Steve Mann is still relevant today. He's great. In fact, I mean, you know, he knocks off all the high end shit. I remember, like, I dated a chick back in 2002 when, when um, what the fuck? Manolo Blahnik, they, re they redid a Timberland sure. boot. And they did like a Timberland boot heel. And I remember Steve Madden, he, he made them for 400 bucks instead of being 2,000. Yeah. And people, whatever. So hold on. So you're telling me he sold 85% then. To me. But like in 2005, how much of the company does he own? Does None. He? Oh, Very little. Shit, dude. Very little. Let me two percent one million. That's very common though. More con Steve. It's it's un listen with Steve, and I love Steve, um, and I'm glad that he became he became rich anyway because of stock options and other stuff. But Steve did, and he's the first one to admit that he had made you know. And I, it's interesting. I even made a mistake by I, I was <laughs> over, no no. This, I was such a good negotiator. This is a lesson to be learned for everyone listening here. Just because you can out negotiate someone doesn't mean you should because they'll end up presenting you. Yeah, true. I, what I did is I, I, I caught myself such a good deal that it became a problem where Steve only had 15% of his own company that got diluted down to like 8% very quickly as we raised more money. So I now had to figure out how to get Steve more equity back in his company through stock option grants and so forth. And then Steve and I, so I was the largest shareholder by far and I ended, and I ended up having to sue Steve it's all public record. It's all a zillion articles on it. So, and that was, it was stupid on my part to, oh, I over negotiated for myself. And also he should have known better. And this is one right. of the big rules of negotiating is before you enter a negotiation, you need to know what the landscape looks like. What does a good deal look like? What should he have asked for? What should he have not settled for less than he didn't know that? Yeah. And, 
and you as the expert negotiator, just because you can take advantage of it, of someone who's unsophisticated, you shouldn't because right. the deal's not all this is the basis for a lawsuit down the road if it works out, right? So anyway, so that's you know, that's bygones at this point. So but we built Steve and I worked I after I left Stratton, I ran Steve Madden for a few years with Steve. We were very we were best sure. friends, very know you know, very close friends. Steve was a brilliant designer and really grew as a businessman. Um and we came up with this really incredible strategy together with the help of a third guy who's a total fucking wild man degenerate named Elliot Levine, one of the most brilliant people in the Garmin Center, but just the with the devil on his shoulder, you know, back then of drug addiction and stuff and craziness, right? So, you know, he was really the Garmin Center guru guy, Elliot. And between the three of us, we come up with this really airtight strategy of how to beat other brands to market by manufacturing our shoes in Mexico versus China. So what we had is these small stores and relationships in Melrose Place and in South Beach and the village. And we would put all these wacky shoes in and see which styles would sell best. And once we had a style that sold really well, we then rather than going to China to get the biggest margin, we'd say, no, we'll pay an extra few dollars. We'll pay in Mexico, get them in six weeks and then beat Nine West and Manu Everyone else, yeah. to, and we, and through sheer like this cycle of always being right. The reason Steve Madden grew is because the fucking shoes sold. Yeah. Steve was an incredible designer. He had a great sense of what worked, and he was smart enough to let me run the business with this guy Elliot, the other great guys behind him. And then Steve really grew as a businessman. That's the story of Steve Madden. That's fucking crazy, man. Um, what you were talking about with uh, over negotiating, mm. that's the record business 100%. They take advantage of every motherfucking and artist. They lose the artist. And the funny thing is, artists hate them later. Exactly. But and the it, thing it, is, it's down now to like, there used to be 25, 30 record labels. Now there's independence all over the place. But I'm talking about majors. And there's been a paradigm shift in how money's made yeah. music because of the internet, right? But with streaming and everything. And but just, what I mean yeah. is, there's only like four majors sure. now. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, it's like you can't hate them unless you really go on your own. But you, you can too as well. But what I'm saying is, it's so crazy because back when I was vice president of Priority Records, we had NWA, we had Dr. Dre, and I remember signing people, and I I would sit there and be like, yo, man, do you realize you're giving half of your fucking publishing for the rest of your life? You're giving this away. And the kid's like, yo, man, I don't give a fuck, man. I want to get a Mercedes Benz. I don't give a shit. I, want, you know, I don't even care. You know, there's this, there's this ultimate question you always have to ask yourself when you're negotiating, when you're cutting a deal, is, you know, how much do I want to trade of potential future upside to get money in my pocket today? And, and what happens is when you're younger, you, know, you want the flashy car, you want the nice jewelry, right? You want all the, the trimmings of wealth, the, the things that people can see. And that's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But you have to temper that you don't understand that that the more you take up front, the more you're going to lose in the back end. 100%. And there's got to be a sweet spot there. That's there's no one no one can really say what that sweet spot is for exactly, but there are some certainly some guidelines. And one is don't fucking give away the store for a yeah. fucking Rolex. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, for sure. Um, you know, at the height of like, um, and it doesn't matter how many employees I had, but like at a certain point, I was running the record label, and I had like 200 people under me, and I I had to go hide. Every point of the day, go get high, go get lit, whatever, and yeah, of course. go in my office. How else would you live? <laughs> what? The, how the fuck was it like running a thousand? You had a thousand employees Three overseeing thousand. that. Three thousand. <laughs> Jordan, I'm gonna fuck you up. Uh -huh. Three thousand employees and overseeing a thousand million. brokers, but three thousand. Yeah, we have thousand. I, had three, right. I was also running two other firms behind the scenes as well. It was crazy. And then you got you got you're looking. You know, you're overseeing a billion yeah. dollars in stock. How the fuck? How did you do that shit? Like, without I'm really crazy. good at math. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right. good with numbers. But you're not I, Asian. That's crazy. Go on. I'm saying. Yeah, I have a good, I'm good with numbers and I have a good, great memory. But I think, um, you know, part of it was the type of drugs I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I was an expert at doing drugs. You know, I'm sober for a long time now. But, you know, Quaaludes had this really short half-life. So I'd be stoned like like a maniac. Then I'd be sober again. So I wasn't drinking much. I was sort of like high as a kite than sober. I had my windows of lucidity, right? Um but, you know, to me, it was almost like it was all a game after a while. You know, it was so easy for me. I think what most people don't understand about success, and especially when it comes to making money in success, is that the hardest you will ever work is when you're not making money. When you are making a ton of money, it's effortless. That's when you're sent, when you're really hitting stride and everything is lined up and the money's pouring in, it's fucking simple. Yeah. It requires almost no effort. Yeah. What requires effort is when you're not making money and you're trying to crack the code, say, why isn't this working? What am I doing? Why am I have to change and pivot? Once you get the system right, it is fucking simple. The money pours in in literally avalanches. It's just that's an ask any rich person. They will tell you, you already see shaking. Yeah, you're right. It's when you're not making money that you have to work really hard. Yeah. I want, but we're going to stay on track, but I want to backtrack for one second because you said something that hits really hard home. Like, 
how the fuck did you kick the drug habit? Because I, I, since I was 13, I've been doing some kind of a drug. I mean, they say weight weed is a drug, yeah. but I've been doing something. But like, I had a little bit of a coke problem, probably like in in the mid '90s to late '90s. And yeah, <laughs> not as bad bit, as yours. A little bit, but you know, like that was easy for me to cold turkey. That it was cold coke is easy, but like pills and all the other shit, much like, harder. It's it's especially the narcotics are very hard. Yeah. So how did you kick the pill habit? So um, I went to rehab for four weeks. Um, you know, I I think with me, what happened was is that. I tried a few times earlier, but I got sober in 97. And before that, I had a couple of false starts I wanted to, but it didn't take. By the time I I hit bottom, April 19th, 1987, I was so fucking sick of it. I was so done. There, I had no illusions. I wasn't romanticizing. Oh, like, drugs are okay. For, I was like, ugh, they're just destroy. You know what I mean? I was at that point where I was done. And when you get to that point... You can get sober in the rooms of AA. You can get sober in rehab. You can get sober in your own fucking living room. It's really more about separating you from the people's places and things that trigger you. So I went to rehab for four weeks and really just like a timeout for me. And I was just so done with it. Like I was just done. I, I, I developed a hatred for it that when I got out, I just found it so simple not to do drugs anymore. Now, I'm not saying I've never done drugs since then, because I have. I've right. gone, I dabbled once a year, here, once. I mean, like, here and there, right? I'm not a fucking saint. I don't ever compare me. But I, drugs are not a part of my life. I haven't I haven't carried a drug on me or bought a drug in 20-something years. Um, I never was a big drinker. I mean, I'll have a glass of scotch or a, well, one martini. But um, for me, what happened was is I'd gotten, I'd gotten myself convinced that I couldn't live without drugs for a while. And then it just took, it really took me to get to the point where I was so sick of it and so fed up and I thought I was going to lose my family and everything important to me. And then like a, a switch flipped to me and I just right. like, I mean, that was it. And then I just needed to be somewhere where I could detox for four or five days. And then, you know, detox, I don't care what you're on, heroin or what, well, I wasn't, heroin wasn't my drug of choice. I'd done a lot of morphine because it was awesome, right? Right. And, and um, but it, you know, the detox is four or five days and then you're done. Then it's a matter of mental, you know, the physical craving disappears pretty much. For the most Don't they part. give you like a pill to yeah, like block boxing. all the shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it, boxing. It, it blocks all the shit. Yeah, it's yeah, boxing. Yeah, I've taken that. Yeah. So like. And that works great, by the way. It's fabulous. Amazing. No, I mean, I, I've done. The only thing I haven't done is inject heroin in me. I've done everything else. I've smoked crap. I've, I've fucking done everything. That sounds crazy to, to say that on my fucking podcast. I, you're right. No, but, I haven't injected heroin either. And that's the one thing I've never done. I wish I had. You right. know, because No, because people say it's like fucking, that's the Rolls Royce. I know. Of, that, that I, don't, I, don't know. I injected myself in the ass with morphine one day. <laughs> no, I was with my friend drowned in a pool and I saved him. And then we were trying to resuscitate him in the hospital. And he was in the emergency room. And like he was in the critical care. And, and like and some famous doctor was a friend of mine. And the doctor goes, like, come with me. And he brought me into the room. And my friend was like dying, lying there, like in his death. Bed, like barely breathing and the doctor walks up to him and goes she goes wake up Elliot and he woke up and all the other doctors were like holy shit that was the most amazing thing and everyone's looking at my friend who's on this like critical care table and I'm like up oh, holy shit and I catch a glint of metal I'm like what's that and I was like I'm like fuck it's a morphine syringe there and they're all looking at my friend so, so I'm like I fucking grabbed the morphine syringe I palmed it put it in my pocket right so now they're all looking at my friend on the on his deathbed and like wow and I'm like wow and also my pocket was growing warm like I gotta go excuse me I fucking go outside <laughs> I run to the fucking bathroom right in the hospital this is Jackson Memorial in Florida I run to the bathroom I pull down my fucking shorts I go about to inject myself in the ass alright and I'm like fuck there's no plunger it was like a it was like a needle with no plunger I'm like, oh, I'm thwarted. I'm like, wait idea I go run to the fucking gift shop and buy a blow pop for fucking 50 cents I go back to the fucking thing. <laughs> I pull down my pants. I inject myself in the ass. I fucking take the blow pop. And go, I, put, I, I inject myself. I hit a fucking vein or something. Next day, I'm boom. It hits me like a, like a fucking thunderbolt. Yeah. Now I'm on the floor in the bathroom. My mouth is bone dry. My eyes are burning. My fucking neck is tingling. I'm loving it. So I'm on the floor. I'm like fucking riding like a fucking snake on the floor. I'm like, right. My wife, meanwhile, was in the emergency room, so I had to go back out to all my friends and my wife. So I try to get myself together. And I'm sl I can't even stand up, right? So I pull my fucking shorts back up. I splash water on my face right I start walking down the hall and like there's an old Jewish couple and passing by and they're looking at me funny and like, I'm like whatever and I walk by they're like Sonny boy I'm like what they're like I'm like what they're like you took us it's like ass for, in Jewish I look back I never fucking I'm walking down like a uh. dart I'm like a darted bull I have the needle sticking out of my ass I'm walking down the freaking hallway I'm like oh thank you <laughs> that was my fucking life you know I mean Listen, man, I got shot, unfortunately, 19 years ago. And I remember when I went to the hospital 
they gave me a morphine drip for the first time ever, ever had in my entire life. It was 2001. You want to get shot again, probably, right? And it was, yeah, I literally remember at that moment, I felt warm and I felt great. I had no pain, no pain at all whatsoever. And if anything, I was like, damn, man, um, I was eating a Jolly Rancher. The flavor was so enhanced. It was nothing like weed or anything I'd ever done. Right. But the crazy part was, you know, I was in high school in 88, 89, 90, so it's like, I wasn't fucking around with anything like that back then, but you know, I always hear about Quaaludes and Scarface. You guys talked about it. That wasn't around when, even yeah. when I was like, so like, I don't understand what, what and I, you know, you could Google it, but it's not the same thing. No. Like compared to like a Vicodin or like a Norco. No, like, what, what? different. So, so the thing with um, Quaaludes, they weren't addictive. Like, like I, so that's what, one reason I was able to get sober pretty easily. So, so I was, my drug of choice was Quaaludes, but um they weren't really highly addictive. Like they were addictive, but more mo- mentally than physically. Um, they they make it was like a, a tranquilizer. Like it was called a hypnotic, um, and they just made you incredibly euphoric if you could make it past those first ten or fifteen minutes. Like so, if you took one and you were lying in bed with your eyes closed, you'd fall asleep. But it didn't take long for people to realize. Well, if I just can fight past that 10 minutes of sleepiness or maybe take a hit a blow, all right, to offset the sleepiness, I can just get this kick-ass, unbelievable high. And it ultimately became the most abused drug in the history of all drugs. So oh, by, by the mid-70s and the 80s, right, when my time came around, right, it was like the most abused drug ever. By the time I really got into them in the 90s, they were illegal, They were you couldn't find them anywhere. I was going around the world... <laughs> To pharmacies like in Spain and Switzerland, <laughs> we were cleaning out pharmacies, buying pharmacies, and and getting these pills flown back in. They were just unbelievable, and they, you know, I single handedly bid up the price of a quail to fifty dollars a pill. So that when I, when I, before I got sober on April seventeenth, the price of a quail was fifty dollars in New York. The day after I got sober, they were five dollars. <laughs> had a standing order of fifty dollars, and the Christ, market crashed. Yeah, you, know? you know, like um. Going back, you know, you're talking about addictive and stuff and everything. Like, you know, with the Xanax, if you take it after a certain amount of time, if you even take it for like months, at that point, you can't stop. You have a seizure. You know, you, you can you can literally, you can, I mean, unless you obviously go to, you get professional help. You can't just cold turkey cut it on your so own. So they you know? say, yeah, I mean, that's probably good advice. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm not really sure if that's, you're not guaranteed to get, I'm an expert well, at this no, stuff, I, okay? <laughs> you're, not, you. you're not guaranteed to get a seizure if you stop, if you radically stop taking anxi- anti it's called anxiolytics, right? Xanax, Clonopin, you know, uh, Valium. Valium, all of them, Zan- uh, uh, so many of them, so, there's all different brands, right? Ativan, you name it, right? There are all these brands of called benzodiazepines, right? right. And those prevent anxiety that, you know, by working in the central nervous system. System, right, and if you stop taking them, yes, you run the risk. It's a small risk of getting a seizure, but what you do feel is fucking massive, and you'll feel like terrible anxiety and nervous, and all these sort of sweats and these terrible things. So you don't want to do that. A seizure, maybe, maybe not, but you don't want to stop radically. But the good news is with that is they are a pretty easy taper. If relatively speaking, what you're probably right. gonna have mostly is insomnia. If you if you aren't, let's say you're taking two or three milligrams of. Uh, of um, Xanax. Xanax per day, right? So it'll be 10 grams, milligrams of Valium, one milligram of Xanax is a blue. So you could be taking two and go to two to 1.5. You can you can taper in a month and be, and it with very little, but maybe some rebound insomnia. While on narcotics, it's a whole different ball of fucking wax. Narcotics yeah. are very difficult to get off of. They require, you know, typically some sort of intervention and or, or a Suboxone type of thing, and that's its own issue as well, you know? I mean, at, at the height of like just, because when, when I like when I, you see Leo's character saying, you know, I take this in the morning, I take this because it's awesome. Yeah. You take this. Like, what was your longest run of consistently taking pills? Would you say just? Out of no, I, I had seven years. I mean, I had probably had one, one or two sober days out of seven years. I was crazy, and when I went, Fuck, and that list of drugs that he goes and talks about, that came from like when I when I got when I went and got sober. I remember, like, so I, you know, I had this just terrible three months. But right before I got sober, I was doing like at least six or seven grams of coke every single day, and just going absolutely fucking six wild. Six or seven grams every fucking day, <laughs> just balls, going man. wild, going fucking wild every single day, right? And I hadn't slept in months and months. I mean, I, I, I was like in my office in the middle of the night with a shotgun. So I thought aliens were coming through the fucking windows. <laughs> like I heard a noise out on my fucking property. I had this huge property. I'm like, I took a shot at fucking, I thought it was a flying source. It was the milkman. I didn't get milk for like six months after that, you know? And when I finally got sober, you know, it was like they went through my bag when they, they launched. My parents came down. It was in Georgia when the whole thing went down. Miami, actually. And I flew to Georgia. 
And my parents, like, you know, they had, had my bag of tricks, basically, and they lined up all the different drugs. It was 22 different substances I was on. It was fucking crazy. I mean, you name it, I was taking it. Oh, on a it. daily basis, though? On a daily basis. How the fuck did you stand up and sell stocks? I, I fucking did. I was sharp as a tax though. I was crazy. <laughs> you know, I was, t- I, I literally, I think on the, on the hit parade was Ludes. So Quaaludes, obviously, two different brands of them, right? I was taking morphine long acting, Percocet short acting was a narcotic. I had narco in there well, just for good measure. <laughs> um, you know, I was taking, I had like um, some ecstasy in mix in the bag. Wasn't taking that every Jesus single day. Christ. I had obviously marijuana, why not? You know, I had- um, What was the first thing you took when GHB, you woke up? Like when you woke up in the morning, what was the first thing? Two hits drug? of blow, one, one and one, then, a three, then four quaaludes. <sighs> Damn, I used to wake at the height of it. I'd wake up at five a.m. because I wanted to be able to get go up and down. With my wife would wait. I wanted my first high to be clean. No one fucking bothering me. So that was really fucking bad. That was like at the height of it, you know. And um, and it's and then I oh and then I was taking clonopin because I liked the way it sounded. Clon like a club clonopin. I take Ambien. Um, I was taking Valium. I was taking um, um, a lot of uh, Paxil, Prozac. I was taking. I mean, I was taking Prozac. Fucking, why not? So this is SSRI. It was like one of the early days. I was like, yeah. Oh. Isn't Prozac antidepressant? Is yeah. That? Absolutely. I, yeah. I discovered Ambien. I got t- I got zip tied by Air Marshal on the way to South me Africa. Me too. I got in- <laughs> yeah, that was true on the plane I did because I went to the stewardess. I, I, thought I, I thought she liked me. No, no, so. I, I, went, I, I had anxiety. So yeah. I started doing push-ups in first class. And then um, I couldn't deal with it. I watched every episode of Fresh Prince. And finally, I was like, hey, man, they're talking about there's seven hours left. And I, I can't do this trip anymore. So there's nowhere to land. You know, you're going over South Africa, South Africa. So finally, they had to zip tie me. Yeah. And um, I was taking oxygen, and the lady said, uh, I can't take any more oxygen. They need to leave 15% of the oxygen tank for the rest of the passengers. And I said, I'll give you $50,000 for it. I don't give I have to have this thing. When I got to South Africa, I considered how many places I'd have to travel so I could do two-hour trips. Yeah, I'd like go to Egypt, go here, go to Egypt to Greece, go to Greece to London, and London to New York. So obviously, that wasn't realistic. And the girl I was engaged to, she was like, you need to fucking figure things out. Found Ambien. Took Ambien for the first time, fell asleep for 16 hours. So I, I woke up, boom, was in Atlanta, then Atlanta, boom. So it was just, once I found out The problem Ambien. with Ambien I've had is that, like, I, I, you know, I'm, I take Ambien, and then I wake up, and it's like, a fucking pot is boiling, a fucking stove's on, <laughs> this fucking food being... I, listen, the, the, the last time I ever took Ambien was in 2001, when I, my kids first moved to California, I came to see them, and I took the regular recommended dose. I was sober for many years now, so it was a doctor-approved Ambien. I took the Ambien, whatever, went to bed that night. Next morning, I woke up, whatever, I'm in, my, in the hotel here in Manhattan Beach, and I'm going about my business, and I call my wife. It's like 10 o'clock. I'm like, hey, um, um, I said, okay, um, you know, oh, I see the kids went to school. It's really great. I'm like, how'd they get the kids to get to school? I overslept. She's like, what do you mean? You took the kids to school. I'm like, what? I didn't, I took, I drove my kids to school in a blackout. Don't remember it. I never, t- and that was like on one end, I never took Ambien again. So it just, and it's very common with people. They do a lot of, you know, they call it somnobulence where, you, where you're walking yeah, you know, around. I, I knew I had, I had sex with some chick and I didn't know I had sex with her. Yeah. And that was kind of fucked up. It could have up. been a gift not to remember that, depending on how she looked, right? But 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 the point is, you know, there's a lot of guys that wish they had that experience. But, but the point is, is that I was so gut wrenched by I never took Ambien again. But on my plane experience, which was in the movie, yeah, yeah, I was gonna ask I, you about where that I got actually. tied up, well, what happened was I, was I was mixing quaaludes and restorals. And when I got on the plane- What's a restoral? A restoral is like a sleeping pill. Oh, okay. And, and they, there's a different class than quaaludes. And when I and when I walked on the plane, I was really fucked up. There's a really cute stewardess. We were flirting. And I thought she liked me. You know, I was catching a rap with her. I was young. <laughs> I thought I was okay. I'm cute. She likes me, whatever, right? And then- um, I don't remember. Like, I don't really, I just remember, like, it was, maybe was there a struggle? I don't remember. Like, I don't, it's just like, thought she liked me. And then, like, when I woke up, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, fuck, I'm tied up. What's going on here? And like, they're like, you fucking went crazy. You were going after her. You tried to, like, you know, stick your tongue in her. I'm like, you know, I wasn't trying, like, I'm like, no. And like, and I'm like, and like, it's that terrible feeling. You're like trying to, did I, t- no, did I, like, or did I? I'm like, oh, no. I never, I don't remember. Like, you know, I, yeah. I, I thought she was kind of cute and she liked me. And then I guess I went over the line. Yeah. How accurate was the movie, would you say, like to, uh, overall? It was, very, it was very accurate in some respects. I mean, the biggest misses were mostly in timeline. 
um, and the collapsing of characters and storylines. So like, you know, you know, poor Danny got the brunt of everything. Like Danny was like the catch all for <laughs> you want to do something wrong, give it to Danny. Because oh, in reality, fuck. a lot of the negative behaviors that Danny took credit for in the movie were not Danny, but they happened, but someone else. It was just that, that when you make oh, okay. a movie, you have okay. to sort of, you have to develop one character. Like for instance, like the whole thing with the, where I passed, so, where I was wired, I was wired, I was wearing a wire. Right. And I wouldn't rat my friend out. And I actually slipped my friend a note saying, don't incriminate yourself. Right. That's true. I mean, I-, I had, But it wasn't done. It wasn't was Danny. It was yeah. someone else. So but in the so, movie's name was Donnie, right? Donnie, but his okay. real name was Danny. Okay. So like, I, so what happened was it was just someone else, right? And you know, I was cooperating, but with information and stuff. When they asked me to rat someone a friend out, I didn't want to do it, right? So, so I, I slipped him a note. And what happened was is then he got in trouble and turned me in. Oh my that's God, how I and I did man. an extra six months for that. And um, <sighs> but they gave that to Danny. So that's an example of something that happened, but not with the right character. Um, nothing like the scene when I met my first wife. In that, when she walked into that big party I had, the Margot Robbie character. Yeah. That's dead on balls accurate. Like, I had this huge party going on, and she calls up in a Ferrari with this guy. His name's, his real name's Alan Wilzig, right? And he's already he's already come out saying, I don't like the guy who played me. He's too wimpy. Well, whatever. Anyway, but his name's Alan Wilzig, and she drove up in a yellow, banana yellow Ferrari with Alan Wilzig. She walked in. She was so fucking hot at the time. She was 21 years old, and... In the movie, Dan, Donnie, Danny, start, you know, as she's told, he starts jerking, he pulls his dick he out. He really starts, had his dick out. No, but it was uh, it was uh, another guy named okay. Mark Hanna did it. <laughs> so that was the, Mark Hanna oh, was yeah, the Matthew McConaughey. Mac- 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 That's the man. So he, in reality, it was Mark who did that. So it happened. So those are examples of things that like were changed, but they were based on right. truth. They were, you know? What happened with Matthew McConaughey, that, that dude, Mark Hanna? What oh, he's a great guy, Mark Hanna. He's fabulous. He's um nice guy. I think he lives in, um, he, he ended up coming to work for me. And then he became a, a minority partner in my company for a short time. Then I bought him out. Then he started his own company. I think he went to jail at some point. Nothing, just just nothing to do with me. I don't know what happened. Did Maybe. he really do that little thing? No, no, no. No, that oh, was, okay. no, no, no. That was, that was my, that, and that's amazing because, so we did stuff like that, just not quite like that. That wasn't quite, that was Matthew McConaughey's. Um, way of like get, getting himself pumped. We did more like, you know, clapping and fucking chanting, but not that. Right. But that was a great thing. Did you have a lot of interaction with with uh, Leo or with Mars Scorsese? Yeah, Leo. We, Leo and I spent a solid year together, pretty much every like six months, almost every day together. A lot of time, and we worked in the script line by line. Not as much with Marty. Really, Mar- Marty is interesting. So Marty and I met Marty, of course, and uh, and Marty. I, I did a cameo in the movie at the end, which was amazing. Yeah, that that. Marty gave me that was awesome. Um, but Marty said to me, he goes, listen, he goes, I have seen every single thing that you've done and I've read all your books. He's such a small, he's a brilliant guy. He goes, I have developed an idealized version of you. I have my version of you. I don't want to spend too much time with you because I can't have the real Jordan Belfort influence my character, Jordan. You get it? It's really interesting. So while Leo wanted to absorb every last nuance of me, Marty was like, I'd rather... I met him, and then we, and of course, I met him and I was on set, right? When at the end of the movie, but he's like, I need to like sort of distance myself more because I, I made a decision. This is who my Jordan Belfort is. And if I see you, I can't be swayed now because I'm locked in. This is my guy. It's pretty interesting. So, and who knows? One can say, whatever he did, he did it right because the movie's amazing, you know? Right. You know, because I'm Asian, bro. And he's ask. Marty fucking Scorsese. No, of course. He's one of my favorite directors ever. Yeah. I've seen every single movie he's done. Um, is, is there, was there really a Chester Ming? Yes, Victor Wang. Oh, Victor Wang, okay. Victor, we called him his name. Victor Wang was this big, gigantic Chinese guy. We used to call him Sweet and Sour Victor because he was like, <laughs> Victor, Victor was like the most succulent looking guy. He's always, you, you, when you saw Victor, you wanted to stick a skewer in his ass and fucking <laughs> put him on a rotisserie, baste him in Sweet and Sour and fucking eat the guy. He was like this luscious looking fucking big, heavy, big Chinese. He was like the indestructible Chinese from like Odd Job from James Bond, like that sort yeah, of guy. Yeah, but you wanted to fucking eat the guy after basting him in Sweet and Sour Sauce. That was Victor. And he was part of your crew, right? He was part of Stratton. He was. Victor was, you know, an outsider that was part of the crew. Is a really complex character. In the, in, in the book, I re- in my book, I really get into Victor was a main protagonist in my book. Didn't get nearly as much in the um, in the movie because Victor was an antagonist of mine throughout my a lot of those years because he had this sort of complex. As he was like he was like this big Chinese kid, in, you know, growing up among savage Jews, and like he sort of like was this like sort of you know bull in a china shop. Yet he was a really intelligent guy, um, but he had a complex, I think, and he could not be loyal to anybody for very long. 
Um, and he had, a, he had a lot of really good qualities, a lot of bad, because very, you know, it, it, it'd be too much to explain the whole Victor dynamic no, I get right it. now. I'm but just, he's a very, but I, that's why. very respect, had a lot of respect for Victor, and also he was just a maniac. You couldn't trust the guy as far as you could throw him. <laughs> um, but then again, a lot of people were like that. But he was very smart, Victor, and he was charismatic. Um, and he was just the greatest character to write about, because physically, he just was like, you, you just wanted to, uh, seriously, if you see this guy, you want to just eat the guy. Where's he, he from? Like, Do you remember? He's from Long Island. Oh, he's from Long Island. Okay. Yeah. He's Chinese. Yeah. Um, which parts of the of the film were were even worse than they were portrayed? The sex and ba- the sex and drugs were far worse. My bachelor party was a million times worse. I mean, brother, my bachelor it? party was so depraved that I can't even talk about it now. It's really not fit for human consumption. When I wrote my book, <laughs> I, when I wrote my first book, and, and the editor I had a female editor, Daniela um, Daniela Perez, she's great, right? And I and I was writing these like crazy things, and she'd say, "Oh my god, Bravo to you!" Like, "Oh my god, people!" I was like, "Wow, okay." And she likes this stuff. I thought she didn't think I was nuts, and I'd write some depraved thing about how I got you know a candle in my ass, and she's like, "Oh my god, that's so funny, you're a bad boy!" And like all stuff. I'm like, "Okay, well, she likes that." And then so for the whole book, she's like, "Oh my god, double." double Double crazy. You're so, oh my God, what a great scene. This is so Then we got to the bachelor party scene and I wrote this whole seven page treatise about like what went down. It was so graphic and disgusting. And I sent it to her and she sends me back a letter saying, I just don't think other humans will understand. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, I know a few who will, but she was like, I think you're right. And we edited that whole thing out. Right. So remember in the, the yacht ride to Switzerland, when you're getting rescued by the Italian Navy and all that and it was like, hold on. And you're like, no, I'm a fucking master diver. No one's going to die on this. Go get the lose. You made fucking Donnie go downstairs, whatever. Was the boat ride really that bad? Was it that heck? Far heck? worse. What? That scene was so underplayed because- When pro- the fucking 100 foot wave is right, it was that it was bad? much worse than that. And it, it, first of all, it went on for 18 hours. And, Holy and shit. once again, Danny got the credit for, it was it a completely different, the person that actually did that was a guy named Rob LaRusso. <laughs> And um, it was one hundred percent true that as the boat was sinking, all I gave a shit about. I'm like, Rob, you have the drugs? He's like, No, I thought you had the drugs. I'm like, Where's it? He goes, I said, Rob, get the fucking drugs. He's like, and he went down to get the drugs, and the and the room was flooded, and he couldn't go down there. He's like, I can't go down. I said, Go down and fuck. He's like, You're right, right. So he goes down. He gets shocked. He had electric. He was short circuited, so he got shocked. He comes back up. He goes, I, I can't get them. This is electric shock. I'm like, soldier, you fucking soldier up. <laughs> He's like, you're right. What was I thinking? He goes down, he goes, gets burnt, but his fucking feet comes back with a bag of 100 loods, you know? So that was, it was much more intense than that. But I mean, when the captain's like, hey, hold on, and the, the glass, sh- like, cracked, much wor- that- Much worse Holy than that. Holy shit. It went on and on and on. We had to push the helicopter over the side of the boat to make room for the landing. It was fucking crazy. And when you were getting rescued, uh, you said you're looking out the window and, and the uh, and that's, jet was That's coming? not true. The jet oh, crashed okay. seven days later. Seven days later, it was taking off out of Orly Airport in France, and it crashed. So after we got rescued, we went to um, we landed on a battleship, and they took us to to a Cal de Volpe Hotel in Sardinia. in Sardinia. We stayed there for ten days, and then after that, we checked out, went to the airport where my private jet was. When I got there, no jet. I'm like, oh fuck. Where's the jet? And I was out of drugs, so there was no reason to be away anymore, right? Yeah. And this is back in 97 or 96. There's no cell phones around. Um, so you couldn't quite, what the fuck's going on, right? Finally, after like about an hour waiting for the jet, and a little Sardinian midget comes scampering up to me. There's a midget there, right? He goes, Mr. Belfort. I goes, plane crash. I'm like, what? <laughs> the plane crash taking off. Seagull flew in the engine, so. Oh, so a seagull really did go in oh, the yeah, engine. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I flew the, uh, I lost the yacht. A plane, it was crazy. What do you think a sequel to Wolf of Wall Street look like? We're doing a TV series this oh, year. Shit. Netflix or what is it? It'll be the Netflix or HBO, I'm sure. So, you know, um, there's gonna Terry Winter, who did the movie, is gonna be doing the show, TV right. show. We already he was on my podcast, we already announced it. Um, so we're gonna probably, uh, I'm guessing it'll come out next, you know, the end of this year. Really excited about that. Nice, my nice. Wolf of Wall Street TV series is going to be a big hit. Oh, I can't fucking. If you need, I, I wish I was fucking bigger to play fucking the Victor Wang guy. What the fuck his name was? <laughs> it's um, not working out right now. <laughs> at the uh, the height of your success, man. What are some of your favorite experiences that you can remember? Yeah, just the, like the most favorite. I mean, I did so much stuff. I mean, I I think that you know the. First thing I did when I, I remember that the really first big purchase I made is when I just, when I first made my first, I think it was a million bucks and I was 23 and I went out and bought this white Ferrari Testarossa. Right. And it just meant everything. It's like, you know, it just meant everything to me, that car when I was 20, a young kid from a poor family. 
that was like just something that stands out. It's just like, and then I mean, I went you know, I spent yachts and jets and uh, trips all over. Just pure insanity. I mean, gambled like like you couldn't. My whole life was one gigantic. You know, you know, experience to experience to experience of insanity. You know that just never stopped. I just kept going on. It just seemed like everything I did just led to one thing. I think you know some moments that stand out are the mo- the evening that I, I invented the straight line system, the sales system that I created. That I still teach today. Um, that was what paved the way for everything. When I you know I started my firm and I tried to call rich. I tried to teach these other kids to call rich people. They couldn't do it. And then. Um, I stumbled upon a way of training salesmen. That was really an amazing moment. That really, to me, was that paved the way for everything. Um, and then just, it was just, I think it was all the camaraderie, the parties, the Hamptons. Right. It was just, it was just, it was everything. It was one gigantic party that went on for a decade, you know? Do you have any, like, toys now? Do you, do you care about yachts and cars now? Is it anything? I, have a, I have a nice car. I have a nice place, you know. Um, I like to fly private. You know, um, nice, yeah. I won't fly private if it's, if it's, if, if I'm going to have to go, I mean, I'm not going to fly private to Europe, but I could take a commercial jet first class. Trust it's me, I know crazy, how much it costs. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. Um, so, um, I, you know, like it's interesting now. I don't even like to drive really. Like I'll take an, I honestly would be, if I'll, uh, I, my assistant will drive my car mostly because I'm, I'm just like to sit there and then text. I'm doing shit all day. You know what I'm saying? I'm busy. Right. Um, I'm really not into that anymore as much. The t- I don't. It's so funny because I, I loved watches. I, I had a zillion watches. I had uh, a, you know, so many cars. I've had a lot of nice cars in the last few years. And you name it, I probably had them all. But just, Back then when you had your Testarossa and you had the Countach and everything, did you ever go fast in them or you just kind of just drove No, I drove like fast. I had, okay. the, I had the police were on the... I had a lot of friends who were police. I had the police close down the highway for me. And You know the little Clairview Expressway? They used to, they used to close down the Clairview for me and let me just drive 180 miles an hour on the Clairview. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I, was I, thought, I, thought you, I didn't hear you correctly. I had the 405 shut down because they came and I had to go reverse almost a mile in my Lamborghini and they, they came. No, the police were working yeah. for me. They shut down the whole highway <laughs> no, for me. No, that was opposite. They, went, they arrested my boy. Yeah. Um, out of all the places you partied in and everything and all the shit just in your entire lifetime, man, is there a, like a favorite particular city or place that you could think of? That's like, like just the most amazing place you've been to? Portofino. Portofino? Love Portofino. Yeah. I've always loved that Portofino. I had so many great experiences there, and call, the uh, the hotel there, uh, the Splendido, and uh, just and not because it's the wildest, the craziest. This is I've had a lot of really good memories in the port in Portofino. I've never been. I've been to Sardinia before. So I've been to, I've been to Caldwell, but it's just beautiful. But this thing about Portofino, the food is great, the shopping is great, and I've just had good memories there. Um. I got a question, man. You know, like today, if you see like this shit's gone again, I grew up, I feel like I grew up in the best era. Me personally, I, I'm, I'm going to be 47 years old in, um, in two weeks. I feel like I grew up in the best era. I got to see, you know, all the shit before the internet, just like Playboy magazines when they have porn and just all kinds of stuff. And, and I got to see the internet now and whatever it may be. But then you like, I go back and I see this fucking Me Too movement. Mm. And it's like, bro, like, what the fuck do you think of this shit? Like, it fucks, people are pulling out shit from 20 years ago. People are pulling out shit from me from 10 years ago. Oh, you called this dude a it's faggot? Disgusting. Like, I was like, yeah, it's disgusting. You, it's fucking crazy, right? So on some level, I'm exempt from a lot of it um, because I went out and, I'm going to say exempt. I think if I did it now, I'd get persecuted. But right. people don't look back on my life and say he did this because everyone knows that was yeah. my, that's my story, right? And I right. paid for all that stuff. I have a daughter and, and I think that things had to change. There was a lot of things that were going on with women being treated a certain way in the workplace that weren't right and healthy, and they had to change, right? And I think that's 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 very clear, and I think that's good. What happened was a wild overreaction where people started getting accused for things with no proof from 10 and 20 years ago. Right. It's fucking disgusting. It's unfair. It's un-American. It's gross. It does not help women. It, it hurts women because... Let me just tell you something. When I go to hire a woman now, I got to be really key. You, oh, you think me, twice about it, okay? Um, and it just, it just, it's, it's. I know like a very good friend of mine is Brett Ratner. Right. Brett Ratner got destroyed. I've, no, I've known Brett for almost. 30, and, literally, and, I've known and, Brett since and forever. And I've watched the women that accused him publicly. I've seen the texts on his phone of these same yeah. women. I love you, Brett. Let me come over and do this to you. I love your eyes. I miss your smile. And they're saying he harassed. What a bunch of shit. Now, did I want Brett? Brett, he has a woman who I Do I want him dating my daughter? Probably not. Right. But he's no Harvey fucking Weinstein. Okay? 100% I agree. So there's, so there's a continuum. Harvey Weinstein should be shot and deballed. I believe right. that. He's a monster, the guy, right? From what I know. I've seen it. In, I've seen Harvey but, at Cannes, like, in action. Okay, like, uh, like, wow. it's, it's a monster. 
Brett was not a fucking monster. He's just fucking Brett Ratner. He's like so. sex. It's all. Exactly. So, so there's a very, and a lot of those girls were playing the game, getting ahead themselves. They all knew what it was about. But did something have to change? Absolutely. And I'm glad it did. It was a wild overreaction. And I hope, and also, it's not just, it's not just the Me Too. It's this whole thing about like the word faggot. I use the word faggot my whole, it never, it doesn't have anything to be gay. Yeah. I've never used the word no, I get it. Once in my life about being gay, yeah. it was always oh, you're such a faggot. Like to a friend of mine, like you're such an idiot. It's like an idiot. It's, it sounds like an idiot. So I don't understand right. like how words. And I'm very sympathetic because, like I'm, I said, I'm the least prejudiced person you will ever meet in your life. I don't care what you, who you fucking not. Who gives a shit who you fuck, right? Real talk. Who cares, right? But this thing with like words, like that, like that way. It's the intention. Yeah. It's what's the intention behind it? And it bothers me that people are trying to be it trying to get triggered, trying to be aggravated. And I think and they the want drama in life. And I think the truth is it's a very small group of vocal people. And somehow for a while it became like the zeitgeist moment of where like, you know, every corporation and board everyone got scared of the internet and the and the whole Ronan Farrell shit. And I and I, and I really hope that it goes the other way significantly and gets back to a healthier version. It shouldn't be the way it was. Women deserve to be empowered and be treated equally as men because they should. Right. They, I have a daughter and she's amazing and she and I respect my mother was a professional always, so I never looked at it like that. But what happened was fucking nuts. And, and I hate more than anything. Forget the Me Too. It was the fucking snowflakes with their safe spaces and their trigger. Get fuck, shut the fuck up yeah. and get a fucking life. You know what I'm saying? You know, like because your age, like you're just a little bit older than my brother. And like, I grew up listening to Andrew Dice Clay and I fucking love this guy. Right. And he'd even make fun of Asian people and I didn't give a fuck. It's Ooh, fucking it's funny. Humor. It's yeah, funny. it's funny. And, and they, they're crucifying him. Like, hey man, he can't do this. He can't play in these clubs in Vegas anymore because of what he said about chinks <laughs> and gays. And I'm like, listen, man, I, listen. And then, but the, the Asian people are like, nah, fuck that. We don't want to hear this anymore. I'm like, I, I think Eddie Murphy had a really good, good take on it. He said he looked back at his old stuff and he cringed a bit today because listen, there's a time and things that made sense 20 years ago, they don't make. But but he wouldn't say I'd take it back because back then it made sense. You can't crucify someone for what they said 20 years ago. Yeah, just, and I think, yes, of course, if, listen, times change. Um, what's considered acceptable changes. And you have to be somewhat sympathetic to that. But, it, but it's got to go back somewhat towards center because you can't be so fucking sensitive in this world, okay? Are you that weak, minded, are you that much like you have no internal barometer of your own self-worth that someone else's words can be that damaging to you? Is there, there's something wrong with that, I believe. Yeah, no, I think so too. So, if, you, if you let anybody, like listen, man, you're letting someone you don't even know. You've never met this person in, entire, in your entire life. You don't know what their intentions are and that one thing fucked up your day, it's pretty fucking crazy. Who you are as a person. And the whole like, Donald Trump thing, oh, just stop already. Just fucking, just vote him out of office. Yeah. You don't like him, vote him out of office. I mean, like, listen, listen, I voted for Trump. I don't love everything he does right. at all, okay? Would I vote Democrat? Maybe if it was a normal, I'm not gonna vote for a fucking Elizabeth Warren or a fucking socialist. <laughs> right. But you know, if, if, if a normal one, I don't know what I would do. But the point is, it's like, you know, when Obama was president, I fucking supported him. Right. He's my president. It's yeah. like, just stop it. Just, Do you have a party with Donald Trump? You're, you, you met I went to a, I flew with him in his helicopter to um, Trump Castle in 1990, believe it or not. Damn. Yeah, back in the day. So I know him. He's a, and listen, you know, listen, I think that he's done amazing things economically for the country. I don't agree. In, in some ways, he's almost like the unfunny comic. He yeah. says shit that everyone else says. And like, and he has a way of saying it and people misinterpret it. The press is trying to misinterpret it. I think um, he could improve his communication, but I think so much of it is just absolute bullshit. Faked, out, it's manufactured outrage for the sake of people just wanting to be outraged. And I think that it's time that the fucking politicians stop fucking trying to kill each other and do your fucking job, all right? And make the kind, oh, it's just fucking wish. stupid already, the whole thing. Yeah, you impeached a big fucking deal like it matters. I mean, just stop <laughs> it. Just fucking pass some laws that bring down the budget deficit to create fucking jobs and shut the fuck up already, you know? <laughs> right. What do you uh, what do you think about like today's like these uh, like these Instagram like stockbrokered people like you ever heard of a guy named Timothy Sykes? Yeah, like I don't think much of it. Yeah, I, I don't really fuck with dude t pretty much. I don't know. I've seen him say some really stupid shit, and then I call them out on it. <sighs> I, don't, I don't think that I I, I so I think that um, I don't want to say I don't know enough about Timothy Sykes right. to say things right. that I, my guess is that it's not legitimate. Yeah. That's just my guess. That's that's I, I said it publicly. I, I don't believe. I think it's just I, without knowing. So forget. Imagine if it's not Timothy Sykes. Yeah. Someone like Timothy Sykes. I I will tell you flat out. There's no way it's legit. 
But right. I'm not saying it's Timothy. I don't know enough about him. Maybe he's that one. It's such a negative. And now he's trying to do the opposite where he's trying to do a lot of philanthropy, which which I get it. You know, you're trying to save yourself and try to, you know, like uh, cover your tracks. I don't know. I just I just thought about it. I was like, what the fuck? I don't know about enough about dude? him individually. Just, I haven't tracked what he's done, but just that, that whole thing that was going on there, um, my guess is it was not good. Yeah. Um, it was so funny because I was talking to one of your employees today. I was thinking like, what do you think about today's dress code? You know, like, a lot of successful people are dressed very casually. I, d- I didn't know how you'd be dressed today. T- I'll tell you the truth. Well, I usually don't like... dress as this casual. Usually I dress <laughs> jeans and a nice shirt, but I came straight from the gym here. It was all a fucking crazy day because it's the beginning of a new year and I just was at the doctor before. So normally I dress m- a more a bit... Um, you know, more. But more. you came up. You grew, you grew up in in the movie. You you had guys tailoring you tailored suits, pretty yeah. much, right? Like custom suits. And well, I think one of the things um that you know I I teach this stuff in, in terms of influence and persuasion. And you know what what's it's really called is you know is dressing for success. But that means a very different thing in every industry. You know, yeah. if you're a rapper, dressing for success means getting Ben Ball to make you some sick fucking jewelry <laughs> yeah. and wearing a certain types of outfits, and then working on right. Wall Street means you dress another way. And and lawyers in New York dress very differently than lawyers in Los Angeles. I couldn't when I went to the first law firm in Los Angeles, I was fucking shocked. They were like in a sweaters and like you guys are lawyers in New York. You'd be fired. Yeah. You wear a suit and tie, and then the agents are wearing suits. At least back then they were when I first came out here. So you know there is no right or wrong answer to Driscoll. The question is this: What does an what would someone that was looking to buy from you, or you were looking to influence, what would they expect you to look like as an expert in your field? That's the question. Dress like that. You're seriously that was probably the most fucking amazing answer you could ever give me. In, in fact, no offense. For your age to to and what you've seen and the fact that I don't even know how how tight in you are to pop culture today, that was the best fucking answer. Because like a lot of people be like, oh no, they shouldn't dress this way. It's not true. It just is. What do you? What would you expect an expert in that field to look like? That's how you want to dress because you dress when you're dressing. It's influence and persuasion. It's your first impression that people people lay eyes on you. They rip you apart. They compartmentalize each piece, how your hair is, how your dress code is, what jewelry you're wearing, what your shoes look like, how you carry yourself, your smile, your eye color, all that in a second, and then put you back together and say, this person is sharp on the ball and expert or not. If you're not being perceived as an expert in your field, then you're seriously behind the eight ball, and that first impression will undermine everything going forward. <laughs> when I saw you, you look exactly as I expected you to look. Oh man, that's amazing. No, I mean, I expect you to look. If you walked in with a suit and tie, say that's Ben Baller. Yeah, the guy that they said is you know, I'm like that doesn't ring true to me. It doesn't ring yeah. authentic to me. All right, um, this is typically not. In fact, I I almost the only reason I'm not wearing something different because I didn't want to be rude and be in a half hour late. I was saying, fuck, I ran out of my nah, lunch. No, 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 but I ran yeah. out of my lunch. I'm aware of, I'm killing you of dress. So my dress code for this interview should be jeans, shoes, a nice button up, sh- like a shirt, but like not on a formal shirt, but clean hair, you know, looking good, shaven. But I just had a weird day today. I didn't want to be late. So that's typically nah, it. man, you're good, man. Um, hey, yeah, we're especially we're on audio. I'm really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're almost done on this. Um, how did you end up sharing a cell with Tommy Chong, man? Coincidence and luck. I mean, I, I I think that well, and also the jail system when they when when you go in there they were too high profile inmates so they put us together uh, to watch us probably to keep us not safe because there was no nothing there was no violence but I guess you know we were both very high profile so they figured well let's put them together um, and we ended up in the same cube we shared a cube for about you know six months um, and it was the two of us just sleeping side by side telling stories to each other and he was the one that got me to start writing. Yeah, I was asking you. I heard he like kind of helped you into talking about motivational speaking and stuff or whatever. Or no, he just he was not that. He just he was you know I would tell him stories and he was like, dude, you got to write a book. I'm like, really? I'm like, because you know I didn't think my life was that crazy. It was it was my life. I was in you know anesthetic. I was almost like you know I had become like almost like numbed my own insanity, right? So when he told me you got to write a book, I was like, really? He's like, dude, it'll be a bestseller. So that was really what it started the whole thing was Tommy telling me to write a book. Yeah. When you got out, though, when you finally got out of jail, what year was that? That was in 2005 in the month of November. Okay, November 2005. Um, so 2006, how did, what, like, what did you start doing? I, to started make writing in, I started writing within 30 days of leaving jail, and I wrote the, for all of 2006, I wrote the book. I just holed up in a small house by myself with my kids, and I just wrote this book. I mean, no offense, but how did you survive, though, if you were just, I mean, like, how did you make money? Did you, did you? Oh, I got, well, but what happened was, so I left, when I got out of jail, I had only a few dollars, right? But I had enough for a small place to live. And then um, I 
what happened was is I uh, started writing and I I sent this, these pages to uh, the first ten pages of the book The Wolf of Wall Street to some friends and they were just dying laughing. One of them was a very wealthy guy and then I sent some pages to a publisher and the publisher's like to, to, to an agent and he's like, dude, he didn't know me. He goes, just stop what you're doing and write this fucking book. You have no idea how crazy this book is going to be amazing. And my other friend was a very rich name George Benedict says. I don't care how much money you need, just I'll write your check for up to a million dollars, just write this fucking book. And then he, so you, he gave me some money to sit home and write the book. And after about 90 days, I sold the book for a lot of money. So I got a right. big advance from Random House and that was how I survived. Oh man, that's crazy, man. With knowing everything you know now, all your crazy shit you've had in life and everything, if you could go back, all the way back to like 1987, what would you change, man? Nothing. <laughs> That's a good answer, man. <laughs> I mean, listen, of course I wish that I hadn't lost people money, although I'm not the, so I'm not the first person to lose people money on Wall Street. I won't be the last, but that was bad. I mean, I wish I hadn't happened, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change my life because that was my life. I mean, the life, my life is so great today and it set me up and that doesn't mean I don't have, it doesn't mean I don't have remorse. It's very different. So of course I wish that people hadn't lost money and I wish that I hadn't hurt myself with the drugs I did and other people, you know, peripherally from the drug consumption, right? But I think that it's a really flawed way to live is to go back and say, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I Rather, okay, this is what I did. This is what's good. This is what's bad. What did I learn from that? How did I grow as a person? You live once and, you know, each instance good and bad serves as a, as a learning experience for you to grow no one lives a perfect life no one doesn't make mistakes everyone has a glass house and i'm just very proud of the way i live today okay and i try to make sure that one thing i will tell you is that since the day i've left jail i have not done one single thing i'm not proud of not even one i have not done everything perfectly but i've not done one thing i'm not proud of one thing that was even on borderline illegal um and i've lived a life where i've given every single person that buys a learning product from you or learns to sell they they whatever they paid to get that product they would have said to me i would have paid 10 times more and that thing is a great way to live. that's my no, life that's today amazing. you know and um so i can't go Go back in hindsight, of course, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish you never done that. I probably wish I would have invested in Facebook when it was first coming out. Me, <laughs> you could always say all this sort of shit, right? But that's not yeah. a, a rational way to live. No, for sure, for sure, man. My last thing I wanted to ask, just because you're a business guy, you obviously are just financially, you, you're, you're on point. Everyone keeps talking about they feel a recession's coming, election year and everything else. What are your, what are your thoughts on a recession coming? I, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I, think, that, I think that there's money to be made in any market, whether it's up or down. And I think that, of, I think rather than trying to time a recession, because no one fucking knows what's gonna happen, you just don't know. Yeah. I think you should try to look a bit more long term than that, and try to find something that's you know a, you know a three to five year window for something you know some sort of you know business that you believe is going to grow in any recession. And also, I I wouldn't really worry about like remember remember this in recessions, you know what really happens. So maybe in a great in a great economic year, the the GDP will go up by three percent or four percent or five. Okay, and let's say in a really terrible year, negative growth, it might go down by one and a half or two percent. Let me ask you a question, honestly. If your income went down by three percent, how much would it affect your life? It wouldn't. It, it wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't yeah. affect your life. 99% of people in the world, a 3% th drop in their income is not going to impact their life that much. Recessions are more about mentality. What happens is, is that when when it's oh my god, is when people stop spending, they get yeah. more conservative, so so they don't deploy capitals. I, I think you, what you need to do is look at, at ideas as empirically being good and bad, as opportunities are always there for you. Okay, and the question is, are you going to work hard? Or maybe even harder when times are not as good. Because here's the thing. If you start a business when times are not good, like I started my speaking career and my business in the worst of economic times. <laughs> it was right after the, the 2008 recession. Um, that was the worst but recession. I, but you know what happened? So yeah. I, but I was, if I was able to make money at that time when times were good, they just fucking soared. So don't worry about recessions. Don't let it rule your life. Don't, you know, listen, obviously if you're in a, if you're in a, a massive company and you need to be planning with buying, you have to have, take some stuff account but it's very fickle the economy and no one really knows what's going to happen next and you know i would just count on you know really focusing your own business and what's happening there fundamentally rather than trying to find macro trends and try to time this fucking really hard to do no for sure you know during that time that was i really considered maybe not doing jewelry because it was a luxury item it's not a necessity at all whatsoever the one percent were fucking not spending as well and like towards end of 09 when it was still really bad 
I said, you know what? Fuck this. I'm about to rechange everything. Everyone's wearing these humongous fucking chains. Rappers are buying $100,000 big fucking humongous chains. I started making chains about this size. And I said, you know what? We're not doing these $50,000, $100,000, $60,000, $40,000. I'm going to make $5,000 chains, $3,000 chains. And for the rest of the year, and even to this day now, I Your just sold, yeah, just yeah, it's killed a, it. As I said, it's opportunity always. It's just a question of looking at things in your own market and, and being smart about it and not buying into like that, you know, there's just one size meets all. There's bad times, there's good times. In the worst of times, people are getting rich and in the best of times, people are going broke. The question is, what are you doing? Listen, all you listeners out there, one of my motherfucking idols just came on the show and burned this motherfucker down. Jordan, thank you so much. You I really it, appreciate it. My pleasure. Unfucking believable. Yo, Miles, man, let's throw a fucking lakey beat and let's uh let's take this one home. So there it is. Uh finally the wolf and baller make history. This was not one. This was my favorite interview so far. We are near 50 episodes in just five months, but we have covered so much ground. All right. It's crazy. You know, Miles and Jordan, the Dust Brothers, they literally produce some of the biggest fucking podcasts that exist. And uh, they say we are behind the baller is the one of the fastest growing podcasts they ever worked on. And it is the, the fastest. Crazy. We're fully independent. All right. If you've listened to what Mr. Belfort said, then you will have soaked up some super free game. Um, he's so goddamn brilliant, man. He's so fucking in tune with even what's going on today, with regardless with his traditional way of, of hustling and selling everything and marketing. He just he's a true hustler salesman. I mean, this motherfucker could sell HIV to a nun. All right. He gave me his book, The Way of the Wolf, and to be completely honest. The last book I read was A Catcher in the Rye, and that was like 32, 33 years ago. I might have to fuck around and read this book. Like, I mean, like, goddamn, man. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Belfort and his entire staff for having me, and I would love to do his podcast, The Wolf's Den. Um, it, Mr. Belfort, if you ever want me on, just let me know, and let's get it cracking. Um, now, uh, I've been talking about this for a couple years now, my phone has gone to the point where I just can't get back to people. I've changed the number three or four times. Had 4,500 un unread text messages. Got rid of got a new number, 800 unread text messages. Got a new phone, deleted those old text messages, and now I'm almost back to 200 unread text messages in like a month or so. Um, I can't get back to my friends, famous people. It doesn't matter who it is. My wife even, all right? I have my wife. Her contact is specially set. So where she has this, you know, special ringtone. She's on emergency bypass, which you can do on your iPhone, meaning if my phone is on silent, if it's, even if my phone's on do not disturb, it will ring or give a text tone no matter what the fuck is going on, all right? So when she calls or texts, you know, um, sometimes my wife just calls to say hello and say she loves me or hey, say hi or whatever. But when I hear her ringtone, I get anxiety. Like I, I just trip out because, you know, usually something's wrong with my son with London or something. But, you know, what I like to use my phone for is like a mini laptop, a mini movie theater, um, obviously to listen to podcasts, but texting has become so fucked up for me. I'm just, I'm really thinking about switching to an iPad and only having an iPad as my form of contact um, to anyone. Uh, I'm just not going to fucking change my phone number again. I refuse to. Uh, it just doesn't work. And um, it's crazy, man. I, I tweeted about it and AT&T said, hey, man, why don't you DM us and we'll set you up. So I don't know what the fuck that means. I was thinking about going to Verizon, but let's see what happens. Um, I have ATT inside my minivan as my Wi-Fi hotspot. But uh, also speaking of cars and shit and driving, um, I'm over driving a fry on a daily basis, man. Of course, the van is awesome. It looks dope and everything, but the van is to be driven in, right? And uh, my assistant has been in and out and whatever. He's, he's great on everything else, but, you know, um, the minivan is definitely just better to be driven in and it's time for me to get a regular car. And by regular, I mean a, like a Porsche, uh, <laughs> a non-turbo Porsche, a non-top-of-the-line Porsche or non-flagship car. You know, I know again, oh, well, it's still $150,000, but it, again, it's not $400,000, right? It's just something that would blend more into Los Angeles and the circles I'm in. I, I don't need to stand out. I'm, I'm good. I'm cool. It ain't a money thing. 
It's got nothing to do with gas or maintenance. I don't give a fuck about that. I just need a regular, and that's like the best daily driving car. I just need to get it. I thought about getting an S-Class Benz, a new body. Um, I still want to be able to smash, you know, and slide in and out of corners and shit and just do whatever I got to do and be nimble. And uh, I'll still have two back seats for London Rider or whatever if I need to. I love, I fucking love the new 992 chassis. It's my favorite Porsche chassis to date. I mean, compared to maybe the old super old school cars. But I just love that new sport design package too. I think it's time. Um, I need to dump the GT4 Lusso and just make that move to this Porsche. Uh, I'm going to see if the GTS is coming because then it's just nothing else needs to be done. I'm not going to lower it. I'm not going to do shit. I'm just going to tint the windows and leave the car the fuck alone. If the suspension is adjustable, I'll do that. Other than that, I'm not getting springs or none of that shit. Um, when I was driving the Lambo Urus, it, it just felt the same way. I don't know. I just can't, I just can't drive the shit on daily. But just the V12 maybe is, is maybe too much. Again, I don't have that same feeling why I just, I just don't, I want to get in and have no fucking, just no, no problems. Um, but who knows, you know, my dumb ass might fuck around and buy a hypercar before the summer comes. Oh <sighs> my God. Um, before we leave, I feel like I know I've mentioned somewhere on this podcast before, somewhere. But uh, I was sitting with uh, the Dust Brothers right after we recorded um, the Wolf Wall Street interview. And we started talking about Monica Lewinsky and the Clinton impeachment and stuff. And these guys edit my show, all right? So they're not just listening. They're fucking like eavesdropping, listening, because they edit my show. And they listen to every single word I say. And they edit anything that's to be edited. And they never knew I went to high school with Monica Lewinsky which is crazy, right? And I didn't just go to high school at Monica Lewinsky. We shared a free period together and we also had a class together. You know, but free period is different because, you know, we're right by the, the cafeteria and, and we share, you know, a circular table with four people, four people including me, right? So every single fucking day, I'm next to Monica and we talk crazy shit. I talk so much shit to her, crazy shit in general um, on a daily basis, you know? Never in a fucking million years did I think that she would get with the fucking president. It's just, it's fucking mind-blowing how much actual Forrest Gump shit has happened to me during my high school years. Just even really from that Beverly Hills high school time. Um, like, you know, I don't think I've ever said I drove Angelina Jolie home when I was a senior. She was a freshman. And uh, listen, she was fucking super cute. I look at my like my yearbook pictures and stuff and I look at it and I'm just like, damn, she was Angelina Voigt, obviously, John Voigt's daughter. She had a brother named Jamie. He was in my age. He was in my uh, my grade. He's definitely 100% off. Um, I don't know if it was on the spectrum. He was just off completely. But Angelina was super fucking cute as a freshman. Super emo, like all black, you know, that type of shit. Black nail polish. Um, almost reminiscent of the girl in Adam's family, except obviously Angelina had a way prettier face. Um, she wasn't like 5'10". Uh, as a freshman, she was still definitely taller, you know what I'm saying? But again, so much ill shit. I'll elaborate someday on um, more dope Forrest Gump high school stories and shit. But um, I had to mention the girl who will forever be in history books as the woman who gave Bill Clinton a BJ. And uh, in fact, he fucking skeeted on her dress. Like, <laughs> all right, that's enough, man. Listen, man, I'll see y'all back on Monday live from green bay i wish you all a dope ass weekend fuck the 49ers fuck all their fans too uh we are outro lakey please hit me one time with them keys <laughs>